All right. Everybody. check the other stuff make sure things are working I'm telling you straight it's my way or the highway so anybody wants to walk do it now All right, we're getting started. Hit that like for me, everybody. We're about to start it. Oh, yes. Gonna have a hot little party. Hey, man. It's hump day. Come on now. Oh, do we have Steph people in there? Can I hear you? Do we have Midas Mighty in there? Can I hear you? Do we have Johnny Million fans in there? Can I hear you? All right. Hear me, I think that's the that's the crucial part. Alright, let's get started. What what happens? How about what happens if I push this button? Oh yeah, that's not one. That's not the I can't push that one, that's wrong. Gosh, it's uh so many choices in front of me. How about I don't know, maybe this one. Oh yeah, that works. Hi everybody, welcome to the show. How are you? Happy uh, Wednesday. My mic is on, everything's good, you can hear me. Audio is good, sound is good, Facebook's good, Instagram, are we firing on all cylinders? We are. Look at that. Hello, Insta people. Uh, I, I, I enjoy your noodles. Why not? <laughs> um, actually, I, I don't really. I mean I, I mean, I do enjoy them. I just don't eat them very often. I, in, in a pinch, they're, they're a lifesaver. If I'm, if I'm really, if I, I don't know if you guys have it uh, like I do, but I have a built-in meter that checks how much monosodium glutamate is in my system. And uh, yes, YouTube, you're there. I heard you. You're there. You're the one we can always kind of count on uh, in its own way. You know, top-tier streaming facility. Until, of course, Truth Social allows for streaming. And then watch out. Papa's got a brand new bag. Um, it's, uh, it's hump day, so hit that like uh, if you give a hump. Um, or you take a hump. I don't quite care. It's okay. Uh, uh, Hinda says, hold on one second. Why is this not coming up? Because it should, uh, chat highlight. There you go. Hinda says, I used to like those instant noodles, noodles, but I don't eat them anymore. Well, I think we all grow. Hinda, I think it's important, right? Uh, Midas Mighty's in the chat. Hype train level two. All right. Yes. Yes. How's everybody doing? Eat a lot of 
uh, Kale Inc. eats a lot of ramen. The the uh, the instant kind or the the fancy pants giant bowl of like Jesus Christ, how am I gonna finish this whole soup? Ramen, because Summer and I eat that a lot. That's a that's you know Summer. That's one of Summer's go tos is a spicy vegan ramen from a place nearby. And it's super good. I tell you, but I don't want the Russians to spray something in it. Think I'm paranoid much? Anyways, <clears throat> now, a couple of things. Chat First of all, like, hi, chat room in general. Good to see you. Doctoring up ramen is good. I agree. Start with some, just, just get the noodles without any of the packets or any of that shit. Oh, the long way. Get some, uh, you know, some bone broth chicken stock, something like that. Oh, Natalie, hi. I was just thinking about you the other day, and I hope you, we get to see you as we're out on the Sexy Liberal Tour. And I insist, if you if you don't have a ticket, you will go as my guest. Um, uh, but we'll get to that later. Um, a- anybody, um, well, we'll start the processed food is gross. All right, well, um, it, again, uh, let's, let's be abundantly clear that um, uh, taking corn off the cob because that's really what you're eating, isn't it? I mean, if you're eating corn on the cob, you're just eating corn. If you're eating it any other way, you're eating corn off the cob. Right? Why would you say corn on the cob? I guess the presumption is that you wouldn't eat it any other way. Well, it, hello, Mr. Fancy Pants. If you just eat the cob, I wouldn't do that. I just It's not the eating it part that scares me. It's the passing it. Um, <laughs> Brian Dologist. <laughs> okay. Yeah, you had to pay for your ticket. Well, Pokey, it, it, like Natalie's been, uh, uh, you know, a true believer in a sport for a long time, and and uh, she she's she's now politically connected. La di da. Um, how about a cob salad? Corn on the cob salad? Yeah, I don't think you should put corn on a cob salad. I really don't. Um, in it maybe, but not on it. It's weird. Um, cob clog. Yeah, I get that. Um, so a couple of things. Uh, can we just start off with the what the fuck is this Sean Combs horse shit? Because, okay, two things. Let me announce right now. Phil's going to be with us second hour. Today has a special third hour. A third hour, ladies and gentlemen, if I may, and I believe that I can. Um, uh, Lev Parnas is going to be joining us. He's uh, on East Coast, and the only time I could get him in here was um, was at what would be effectively another hour onto the show. So I'm just going to roll with it, baby. We've done it before. We've done it in the evening show. We're definitely going to do it today. What do you think? So uh, Lev Parnas will be joining us. And I have a lot. Uh, first of all, we'll get the this puff nonsense out of the way. And then I, I have, you guys know that I have special questions for Lev. Maybe questions he won't necessarily get anywhere else or he hasn't gotten in a long time that are still kind of uh, tickling my fancy, as it were. And um, so it's great. So yes, Lev is in the third hour. So hang around, come back, watch it later, however you need to digest it. It will be a great conversation. Um, Aaron was on and his son and he's lovely. He was a gentleman and it was a great guest and is a good human being. So obviously Lev is doing something right. And uh, I, don't, I, I feel like I owe him an apology for making so many fraud guarantee jokes, but I think he knows. I think he understands. But uh, anyways, I'm excited to have him on. It'll be a great conversa- conversation. Meanwhile, um, uh, this is so fucking weird. All right. So um, th- uh, I, there's so much. Uh, all right. I, I honestly, I got to say, I appreciate all forms of music, and you guys know I'm not here to yuck anybody's yum, and I don't have to like what you like to love that you love it. Understand? So that's, that's the way it is and the way it always will be. But there are certain types of music that just don't do it for me. That's what it is. And and you know what? Some it and I guess it I guess there's some debate about what it actually is. Because some music, you just need to dance. And if it's not danceable music, it doesn't do it for you. We came out to dance. You're playing this. I, I, I love the the Yulian pipes. I love the soundtrack of Braveheart. However, if I'm at a club trying to get my groove on, it's just, you know, it's, it's a square peg round, a round hole situation. That's okay. You know, like this is the worst song to play right now. Might be the perfect song to play when you're crying in your car, but it's terrible now, right? 
So there's a difference. There's another thing, too, is that most dance music at clubs would be really awkward at a funeral. Um, yes, some, some music sucks, but again, uh, that's largely opinion. Most of it's in the execution. And there's a, I, I also believe there's a, there's a tipping point with music where something can suck so bad it's actually good because it, it's, it satisfies an it, which is by just being hilariously silly to the point of like, you're just having a good time. Like you've, it's so ridiculous. It's jump the shark. You know what I mean? I would argue that, oddly enough, YMCA is one of those songs. That song is fucking ridiculous. I mean, it's, of course, more ridiculous that maggots play it at Trump rallies. And we know why they do, because he's trying to remember, remind people of USMCA. And so YMCA, I guess, why do we need Mexico and Canada? Is that the subtle message? It's stupid. Um, but... It's, it's, it's about hooking, it's about gay men hooking up at the YMCA. It, it, honestly, you can get yourself clean. You can have a good meal. You can do whatever you feel. Uh-huh. Right. Uh-huh. Lights out at the YMCA, kids. Um, <coughs> I mean, even the, in, in the Navy was less on the nose. Disco duck. Sure. That works. But I, I just love that there, it's like, the gayest of gay anthems, and they're playing it at Trump rallies, and everybody's like, that's the, the greatest. You're like, okay, fine. Um, the nice thing is, is when it's played, at, you know, at a at a Democratic situation, like you're at a club or whatever, if you're on our side of the aisle, you can know what it is and dance along with it and not have your sexuality questioned or have to worry about it. You just, right? It's just, you're fine. It's fine. It's like, who cares? You know? I could dance to "It's Raining Men" and and not go have worry about somebody going. What what is fucking, what Sparks doing? <laughs> um, especially if let's see if I'll is a hold on. I have to do it this way or I'll uh, crash my whole system. Um, if if there's anybody that actually questions, um, my you know my commitment to uh my fearless heterosexuality and that I don't have to worry about it. Um, I, I think I, I have one, I guess, simple answer for you folks, which is this, um, that's, that's me. That's just a gif. It's okay to have funny feelings when you see it. It's okay. You're all right. You're going to be fine. It's okay. And, uh, and I'll have you know that after doing that, uh, it didn't turn gay, didn't magically become gay, didn't, didn't, wasn't contagious. (laughs) <laughs> seriously had no effect you're gonna be all right you don't have you don't have to worry that like if you get downwind from gay you're suddenly gonna be gay it's not how that works you know and so if you're secure in that fact you can dance to ymca knowing full well what it's about and uh are you attracted to her her that's me <laughs> that's <laughs> um i do look beautiful thank you very much I, that's very sweet Wait a minute, how did I not realize that was Hal? Oh, Maria, you didn't realize that's me? Yeah, I'm the blonde. I have very full lips, it's true. Um, that's right, it's an it's a scene at Pride where my character doesn't want to go to Pride because he's in the closet, so his friends dress him up in drag so he can go to Pride and march with his mother and the P-Flag thing. Uh, yeah, um, and uh, a, his boss is there like hooting at people and yelling shit. But he thinks Michael, my character, is uh, is really a an actual woman, and uh, and, and then I, I kiss him, and then he finds out later, and then I I I say the same thing to him later when I'm not in drag that I said before, and freak him out and whatever. That's kind of thing. you thought it was Sandra Bullock. <laughs> I did. Well, that's why they had to dye my hair blonde. That's why they had to. Yeah. That's a, that's yeah. They had to. They had to make me blonde for that one. Uh-huh. From queer, no, from Queer as Folk. Queer Eye is a reality show. Please know the difference. Anyways, point being, I do, I do look good. I should play her brother in something. Her younger, nicer brother. <laughs> right, okay. So, you, you really thought that was a girl? Ah, uh, thanks, guys. I appreciate that. Yes, that's not a girl. That is me. 
Uh, see, look, you can even, whoops, hold on, sorry. You can just see, see, I can't pause it because it's not video. But see my nose? My big ass nostrils? There you go. So anyways, um, uh, yeah, you had, fancy had no idea? Okay, all right. Kelly knew it was me. All right. Anyways, if you've watched uh, Queer as Folk, you've seen that, maybe, perhaps, or whatever. Um, uh, thank you. I appreciate that as a compliment. I take it as a compliment. Don't worry. Um, but, uh, <laughs> I, said, I, I like my nose. It's all right. Yeah, it'll do in a pinch. Um, yes, that is me. That is indeed me. Then the, the blonde is me. <laughs> I do have a pretty mouth. It is true. Um, wow. I've, 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 that's funny. Took a minute to realize what you're looking at. Oh, I should have just, yeah. So, um, <laughs> this is getting really weird really fast. Anyways, point I'm trying to make is <clears throat> there's certain types of music that I can, uh, Ellen Barkin, that's another good one too. I've gotten Ellen Barkin before. I've also gotten, uh, when my hair is down, uh, Julia Roberts. Yeah. Um, anyways, so, um, <laughs> yeah. I was thinner then. I was, yeah, I was less husky. Yeah. Um, so anyways, like it, I, I'm just not a fan of Sean Combs's music, let's just say. And so all this crazy shit that's coming out, hold on, let's see what come up here. Um, like about him where the people are like somewhere between we always knew and we had no idea. Um, yeah, uh, is a very weird, weird place to be. It's very Jeffrey Epstein in that way, right? Yeah, it's, uh, it's super fucking gross. Anyways, uh, history legal drama includes a 1999 arrest with ex Jennifer Lopez where she was handcuffed to a pole. Like, I wasn't aware of this per se. She's also apparently in the, uh, somebody was shot in a, in an exchange, like, at, when Sean Combs was at a, uh, at a club or something, and there was a shooting, and it was one of his, you know, like, one of his rivals or somebody got shot there, and, uh, it turns out, uh, word on the court is, word on the street or whatever, is that Jennifer Lopez brought him the gun that he used to shoot the guy, and, and then smuggled it out or some shit. Um, really fucking weird. Um, and, um, and, you know, she's put that obviously behind her, what have you, but, uh, gnarly time. Uh, Sean Combs, known as Diddy, P. Diddy, Puff Daddy, 54, which, by the way, I'm the same age as Sean Combs, and he has, a uh, a, a, an airplane. So, gotta work on that. Um. Now, you know, but but then uh, allegedly he's responsible, according to Cat Williams, for the death of Tupac. So um, I would I'd rather if if that's what it costs to get a plane, I'm not interested. Just saying. <laughs> maybe you can fly his plane. I could go, you know, maybe it gets seized and it's sold on auction. Maybe. Anyways, Monday, the rapper and hip hop industry titan. Had his homes in L.A. and Miami raided as part of a federal sex trafficking investigation. One of the most fucked up things about this, and I think we all looked at, you know, when Trump's, when Mar-a-Lago had a, a legally obtained search warrant um, issued and, uh, and law enforcement showed up with it and conducted a search of the area and retrieved classified documents and other evidence of criminality um, that I think... Uh, we we're, we we're kind of like you we were shocked but like a little bit i guess not shocked not shocked mm -hmm. um that it was FBI and and US marshals that's usually how it works it was not a raid gato gordo it was not a raid because my rule is it's not a raid unless they either kick in a door or they have guns drawn which none of those guys did and uh, or uh if if you really wanted to be a raid they have to uh they have to repel in through a skylight this was a fucking raid. The, 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 the shit where they went to his, let's see if this plays. Yeah. So I don't know if these are still images that they have up or whatever, but, um, yeah, put the, show the trucks, you pricks. Um, yeah, it, the, here's the weird part. It was fucking Homeland Security. 
right? That was the part that stood out to me. Of all the weird details, and there are plenty, you know, the, uh, he's part of the uh, black Illuminati or just the plain old Illuminati or the, I don't know what the fuck, kind of Baphomet fucking uh, Hollywood he's supposed to be part of. First of all, can we just separate the fucking hip-hop music world away from Hollywood? Because that's like saying, like, the country music scene is Hollywood. Like, anything that's just basically famous isn't Hollywood. He doesn't make movies. He's not in them. He shows up in them because of his celebrity occasionally or something. But that ain't what he does. That's ridiculous. It's not, why, why is Hollywood on the hook for any of this shit? Any more than it would be on the hook for Jeffrey Epstein, for fuck's sake. How come How come everybody goes after Hollywood and trafficking and all this stuff when it's hip-hop mogul puff dipshit over here? Or Jeffrey Epstein, who was in finance and real estate. Why isn't everybody going, you know, that's the thing about the, the uh, financing and real estate, just a front for t- trafficking and they worship the devil and blah, blah, blah. Like, you know what I mean? It's just fucking weird. It's political. I Well, I agree. Yeah, that's true. Yo, oh, you mean his arrest? No. The 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 calling of it Hollywood is, yeah. Um. Uh, let's see. Uh, although it's not the most dramatic, it isn't his first personal. Various legal woes have included various arrests and assault when he was, of course, arrested uh, <clears throat> on an, in the Alps while skiing. <laughs> Kidding. Why does everybody wear a giant coat? Oh, right. Guns. Um, and my video, uh, she looks really happy there. Yeah. That, that, when you're, when you're, when your girlfriend or significant other has that look on her face in a picture with you, she's looking away and kind of dead eyed. Uh, she's, she's got one foot out the door. I'm just saying. Um, here's the story. Jennifer Lopez arrest in 1999. Diddy and his then girlfriend, uh, Lopez, 54. She's the same age as me as well. She looks fantastic though, by the way. Um, were arrested on weapons and bribery charges. Both of them. Uh, on December 27th of that year, Combs and Lopez, who dated from 99 to 2001, partying at a club in New York. When they were leaving, Combs bumped into a man named Matthew Scar Allen. Why? Because Matthew doesn't sound tough enough or something? Uh, Combs bumped into Allen pushed back, leading to a fight in which shots were fired. Three clubbers got injured. Clubbers. Well, it'd been nice if they were just clubbed as opposed to uh, shot. By a, so he got into a fight with another dude. That did that dude didn't get shot. He didn't get shot, and uh, yeah, Combs and Lopez left the scene in his car. Got pulled over for running a light. Police found a gun in the car, which led to the couple getting arrested. Uh, uh, yeah. Wait a minute. Is that Joey? Joey Fatone. How did you throw yourself in the middle of this? And also. It, what what is it with your hair? All right. Um, now retired MIPD Derek was in Midtown South Korea. They brought in. Uh, there were all these high profile lawyers barricaded in the station, waiting to talk to the desk officer. Uh, they had J Lo handcuffed to a pole. Well, that's how it works. It's like Navarro bitching about something. Sorry, you break the law. That kind. Of, I mean, you're found with a fucking basically a, a a gun you're not supposed to have after a shooting while fleeing the place and running a red light. You're going to get cuffed to a pole. They they can, especially if, I mean, rich people with multiple passports, flight risk. I'm just saying. If you don't believe me, where's Diddy right now? Um, I can't believe I actually called him by that name. Can we just, can we, if you get, can we just make a new rule? Yeah, P. did it. Yeah. Um, can we just make a uh, new rule uh, that, once you get busted for something as awful as this, yes, YouTube, um, once you get busted for shit like this, we don't have to call you by your cute nickname anymore. You know what I mean? We go back to your real name. you just Sean Combs at this point. You know what I mean? You don't get to have like a, you know what I mean? Like nobody referred to Al Capone as Scarface, you know, when in his, after he was arrested. It was like uh, Alphonse Capone. They even said his full name. His name is Sean Combs. Simmer. Puffy fluffy. Um, yeah. She was crying all over the place in the squad room. She was just upset about the whole thing, I can imagine. Uh, ultimately, she was absolved after reportedly being detained for 14 hours. Combs got indicted on two counts of criminal possession of an unregistered gun and attempted bribery for alleged, 
like, trying to get his bodyguard, Anthony Jones, to claim the weapon was his. So he's going to, like, oh, he's bribing a witness, essentially. The guy, that would, that's how it worked. Okay. Um, yeah, she looks real happy. Uh, Combs was later acquitted. Um, he's always bragged about having people inside, you know, NYPD and LAPD and all that shit. Uh, his protege, Jamal Shine Barrow, who got arrested with them, was convicted on two counts of assault as well as reckless endangerment, gun possession, sentenced to 10 years in prison. He served nine before being deported to Belize, where he became a politician. Okay. Uh, he was arrested for allegedly swinging a kettlebell at an assistant UCLA football coach after the coach allegedly yelled at Diddy's son, Justin, now 30, who played on the team. Diddy was charged with assault with a deadly weapon, a kettlebell. You just try to hit a dude with a fucking kettlebell at a game. Not only is he a dick, he's that dad. Uh, but the Los Angeles district attorney decided not to prosecute. Yeah. No one was seriously injured and Combs reps claimed the mogul was acting in self-defense. Mm-hmm. Uh, Cindy Ruda uh, alleged she was regularly made to prepare and serve food to Diddy and his guests while they were engaged in sexual acts, which is not illegal, but a spokesman, unless she didn't, it was under, you know, duress. This is a frivolous lawsuit by a disgruntled ex-employee who was fired for college. Okay, so she sued him for making him do icky stuff. The lawsuit was settled for an undisclosed amount. Again, uh, all I'm saying, uh, Trump Combs 2024, it makes so much sense. Uh, Cassandra Ventura, that's the one that's recently filed a lawsuit against him. She alleged that he abused her, uh, forced her to have sex with male prostitutes while he filmed it. He abused her physically, kept her drugged up during it, had other guys drug her up. Ugh, it's just fucking gross. Um, see, this is, uh, I, I gotta tell you folks, this is, uh, this is why I don't do drugs and why I will never sleep with a woman who's under the influence of anything because, uh, you can't consent if you're under the influence for one. And uh, I, I work way too hard for you to forget it in the morning. So, uh, <laughs> Cassie also alleged that Diddy forced his way into her home and assaulted her during their longtime relationship in 2018. Oh, hey, maybe he's friends with Russell Brand. Good vibes. Maybe. Oh, thank you, Charco. Thank you so much for the super chat. <clears throat> Diddy's attorney. Uh, Sean Combs is attorney. You're a newspaper. Act like it. Uh, Mr. Combs uh, uh, denied the accusations of page six, claimed that uh, Ventura had been demanding money. Mm -hmm. Case was swiftly settled out of court. Um, well, then why not? If she's just, if it's a lie and she's demanding money, take her to fucking court. Go for it. I mean, it, you know, what are you afraid of? If funky sex shit will come out about you? It already has. Uh, one anonymous woman claimed uh, he and singer Aaron Hall uh, sexually assaulted her and an unidentified friend in uh, 1991. Jane Doe was offered more drinks and was coerced into having sex with Combs. Um, calls it fabricated. This is nothing but a money grab. Uh, again, level of intoxication matters and coercion is not quite the same thing. I mean, I like power dynamics being what they are, but it's just weird. Like that, that part of it's hinky and he's got enough like violent assault that, yeah. I, 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 it's easy to believe that uh, th that's how it worked there. Accusation of sexual assault from a male employee. This is the part that turned the, that the, that turned the worm. And this is the part that apparently Cat Williams has been talking about. Cat Williams uh, um, has said that, <laughs> that, that this fellow, Sean Combs, offered him $50 million to have sex with him. And, um, and, a, uh, and apparently... Um, what, what he would do is very Epstein is that he would pay these guys to have sex with him or have sex with somebody and then he would film it and then use it against them is the idea. Uh, uh, and I, here, here's what I would like to say to the, by, and this is the thing. This was the part that stuck out to me. Fucking Homeland Security. Homeland Security. That's some 50 million you're in. Yeah, that's a, that was the, what you call it? Um, yeah, a couple of guys made jokes about that. Like, I'd do it. Whatever. Um, but the fact that it was Homeland Security says to me that there's a lot of it has to do with guns and human trafficking mixed together. You know what I mean? That, that basically 
has with all of his money, he's running a bunch of secondary illegal shit trying to triple his money. Well, they say it's about sex trafficking. That's that's the one they know about. But there was also mentions of drugs and guns, specifically not for personal use or whatever, but that he was, especially his house in Miami, that he was basically trying to become Scarface down there. The 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 movie version, not you know, the Tony Montana version. Um uh, in March 2024, uh, law enforcement sources told the Post that feds moved in to raid Diddy's, uh, Sean Combs' homes Monday because they wanted to seize his phones and computers. That's because that's where it all tracks through, right? They also alleged there were further raids on houses associated with uh, the mogul in New York and Chicago. Um, further sources told the Post that the raids were led by Homeland Security Human Trafficking Task Force based on a search warrant issued by the Southern District of New York. Earlier today, Homeland Security Investigations New York executed law enforcement actions as part of an ongoing investigation with assistance from HSI Los Angeles, HSI Miami, and our local law enforcement partners. Uh, we will provide further information as it becomes available. His uh, sons were uh, detained and cuffed. They were on site. So if you're on site of some place like that, they're either going to put you in a vehicle or they're going to cuff you. If you don't get in the vehicle, which they probably didn't want to do, they will just cuff you. And you can sit over on the side. And basically, it's so you don't run in and and go, I got to get my medicine and then throw fucking evidence in the trash or, or in the in the toilet or any of that shit. Um, or consume it or destroy it or set a fire or any of that shit. So um, in connection to this incident, sources told Rolling Stone that at least four Jane Doe's and one John Doe have been interviewed by New York prosecutors in connection with the sex trafficking allegations in a RICO case. Uh, after the hours after the raid, he was seen pacing back and forth outside of Miami airport. Now, I this would be part of the uh what um, part of this is that um, uh, that's uh, let's see I'm spotted outside of my that's not a picture from that though. Um, he was like wandering around, um, and there was a lot of question about whether it was actually him. No, nope, that's it. Okay, um, you know what I mean that it was that it wasn't yeah. Still waiting for my ramen story. I didn't have a ramen story. I was making a point like that we just got lost on a side uh, note. Other than just make your own ramen, I'll I'll post a uh, I'll post my recipe at some point if you'd like. Um, anyways, so chat room, I thoughts any any because here's the thing, the part that sticks out to me. Oh, and his uh, his drug mule was arrested. I forgot to show you that part too. So, so he has a drug mule, this guy who used to bring him his drugs and carry his drugs and fly his drugs and and put his drugs in his pants or whatever. This guy right here, Brendan Paul, um, he intercepted Denny's plane and is facing one count of, I don't know, of drug smuggling or whatever. He's his drug mule. He's arrested in Miami Airport, um, uh, Opa Laka, after the feds intercepted uh, Diddy's plane. He's booked on, they didn't intercept it. I guess, or, or, oh, he was on it. I guess it, it, the idea is that, then that means that Combs wasn't on it. Drugs were found inside Paul's travel bags, according to paperwork provided. By, he was arrested after they tested the <clears throat> the uh, narcotics. He's been bailed out, according to TMZ. Federal officers who found the drugs in Paul's bag were working in Homeland Security, raided the home and, uh, border, prote uh, and border protect the outlet. After obtaining a search warrant and border protect the outlet said, and and border protect. I don't know. That's a weird sentence. Um, <clears throat> that's this dude. This this is exactly who you would expect to be uh, the guy that carries Sean Combs's drugs. No beats were found. Right. Um, yeah. Super weird. Um, yeah, this is uh, just can't hang yeah, There's not arrested. Yeah, same shit. So I mean, there more stuff will come out, no doubt. Um, but uh, about like as far as the trafficking of it, but I like it's so weird. Like I would argue, I would put this in the category of how much. Uh, why is enough never enough? You know what I mean. Like, in the case, like, Jesus Christ, the stuff, the houses, the things, the, the, the fucking access you have. Look, I'm here to tell you. And, uh, <clears throat> it's not just because I look fantastic in drag. But, um, 
as somebody who's very aware, and, and don't get me wrong, this is not false modesty. I, I am happy with my what I look like, and I'm happy with my height and bone structure and skin tone and hair and all that stuff. I don't, I don't whinge about it. But I am also aware that I am not Brad Pitt. I am not Chris Evans. I am not, you know, the these, you know, the the Hollywood Adonis types or whatever. And I'm certainly not all my all my life as somebody who's five nine and you know up until a few about a decade ago I was like a buck thirty fully clothed soaking wet. Thank you very much. I am. You're right. I am a star, um, and that helps. Uh, and that's kind of my my point. Um, why would I want to be? I, it, that's not the point. Um, the point is, is that the, the, the idea that there's an automatic magnet to those kind of guys, whether they're famous or not, that if you're in a room with one of those guys and guys will tell you this, that if you don't look like that and that guy steps in, there's an element of like, Voop, in the same way that if some woman walks in with her, you know, uh, with the, and, uh, and the other ladies are like, of course they're all staring at her. That's the point. Um, that you know that there's certain just eye draws that immediately happen. You can don't worry. You've got game. You can work yourself out. That's not the problem. But that's absolutely the case. Is that there are people who will automatically draw eyeballs, and then there are people who have to work for it, like myself. That's all. And the point I'm trying to make is, is that just the amount of fame I have, which is you know not insignificant. I get recognized every single day when I'm out by variant people from all kinds of different stuff. And it's a lovely experience every single time. I couldn't be more proud of the work that I've done. And I'm happy when everybody, whenever anybody steps up to me and goes, I like your work. They're, I don't even, A, I'm not even sure right away what they're talking about because I have a lot of work and that could be any number of things. It's great. It's a lovely thing. And it's, it's invigorating and inspiring every time it happens. And, um, but I'm also aware that the attention that I've gotten from the ladies um, over the course of my career since I was on Talk Soup forward to now versus before that is very stark. It's very different. Okay? There's a difference. There's a difference between the attention I got from women after I became known and had a career and all that kind of stuff and before. Right? I did I did fine. Uh, don't worry about it. My my friend Dan, who, you know, as they always say, is is queer as a football bat, and the entire time he was in his in the closet, his closet had a glass door it was obvious to everyone um and was known for just speaking his mind at random whenever said to me once how did how do you end up dating all these pretty girls <laughs> and i was like fuck you <laughs> what do you mean what he meant was you're not handsome enough to be with the girls you're with like your girlfriend is way too pretty for you that's what he was saying seriously um yeah uh, there are not 75,000 dead children in 35,000 people, Patty. I, I think you added a zero. But um, uh, anyways, that was that was the, yeah. So I, you know, I, I took funny offense at it, but that's what he meant. And he wasn't wrong in that regard, right? Maybe he wanted tips. He did not want tips on how to pick up girls. That is for goddamn sure. Um, but the point is, is that anybody will tell you that if you're, you know, if you're in a club or something like that, like if I, I'm five nine, if there's a dude who's six two, or there's a fucking basketball team or a football team behind me, um, I was always punched above my weight. That's what I do for a living. That's my life. I'm excited about that. That's what wakes me up in the morning. Um, why do you think the show looks like it does instead of me just filming it at my desk? Um, I'm a crazy person for that. I'm always punching up. I'm always uh, I'm a climber. It's just how it works. My girlfriend in high school was six three. That's <laughs> <laughs> that to give you some indication of how a bunch of a climber I am. So, uh, point being is that um, I'm aware of the difference that being famous makes between, yes, I am, but uh, I am 5'9". Um, the difference that being uh, famous makes, you know, versus not being in terms of attention from the fairer sex. Okay, so let's just, that's on the level that I, I know this. I, I've experienced this. I recognized it when it was happening. Meanwhile, um, Sean P. Dipshit Combs has had far more fame, far more attention, far more like scattered ass thrown his way 
just because of the world he operates in, the kind of, you know, the industry he's in specifically. You know what I mean? You don't have to take it. It will be freely given to you because people will seek you out. Right? That's the point. That's what I'm saying. I don't get it. If I if I know I'm a, I'm able to because of my you know the even the the modicum of genuine celebrity that I have, I have experienced this. I can recognize it when it's happening to me. Holy shit! The level this asshole is on. So the the fact that he needs to do that to anyone speaks less about, I mean, A, his primary, I don't know, whatever, his dissatisfaction with life is pathological, but also just the there's a cruelty to it is all I can say. Right? That's what it seems like. This has nothing to do with sex or interaction with somebody. This is just power and cruelty. There was a joke, well, it's not even a joke, um, and by the way, Philip Bittner is going to be joining us in about uh, 15 minutes. And then, like I said, third hour, Lev Parnas will be joining us. There's, a, um, there's an anecdote that I would like to share with you from my time filming Queer as Folk. And for those of you that want to see this again, there it is. Um, so um, there was a, some of the people who worked on, our, on Queer as Folk um, basically, they were just, God bless them, they were the hardest working production people. I loved everybody who worked on our show. They were just terrific. And the makeup people had to deal with everybody directly. But then, the, like, the first and the second ADs were, you know, they were on project after project after project. It was I famously, uh, um, one of our ADs had to call a, a, a well-known actor who kept changing his flight over and over and over again. And she was talking to the person's assistant. And she's like, we're trying to work this through, like, when they're coming in. But um, why does he have to keep changing his flight? And they didn't know that it was they were on speakerphone. And the, the actor in question said, it just it loudly in the background said, because I'm a fucking movie star, that's why. That was it. Like, woo. That kind of, like, and these are, again, these are grunt level people in terms of production. Uh, I never, I never spoke to anyone like that, by the way, and nor would I. Um, that said, uh, at one point they were filming an uh, action crossover movie of something. How? Oh, what's an intimacy coordinator? It's the person who helps you work out those sex scenes so that you can get what you need without crossing any boundaries, and each actor is comfortable and it looks convincing, and you can do it in. You know, you don't shoot something in full, you know, like you're just filming sex like a porn. You have to get certain images and it's got to be certain ways. So you work out. It's basically like you create a football plan, like a, a pl like a play. Like your hand goes there and then this hand will come over here and then they'll have the kiss and this, that kind of stuff. It can be that specific or it can be kind of vague. Anyways, we had one on, uh, on Queer as Folk. Um, most of the time we just worked out kind of with the director what we were doing. But, the, but anyways, they were filming this movie and uh one of the guys on there was a hip-hop star to be uh, unnamed i don't know that i would i knew him at the time and i don't know that i would know who he was per se but he was very famous hip-hop person starring in a movie that was being shot in canada which is fairly common and apparently um as the telling goes um uh the ad saw the women and everybody going in and out of um uh, uh, their their trailer during this whole time and they were really dreading having to go over and knock on this person's door and call them to set because they were like I'm fairly certain they're naked in there doing all kinds of stuff and it's nasty and there's like six people in there and whatever and then they've been in there all day and probably drugs and other shit right and before she can get a chance to knock on the door the said actor slash hip hop uh, superstar um, pops the door open, is completely naked and sweaty and covered in kind of bleh, and goes, announces to the world, I said, 
I'm tired of fucking. That was it. That was the, for real. Tired of fucking. They've been, they've just been having sex so much that they just fucking decided to flash the whole world and yell, I'm tired of fucking. Yep. So, uh, that's, uh, God bless first and second ADs for one. And, um, again, if you can live a life where at some point that thought even crosses your mind, <laughs> cause I've never had that thought ever. Um, and, uh, yeah. Um, yeah. And, and I, I, yeah, I was about to just, you know what? I'm, I got to save something for the only fans show, um, details in her, her memoir. But, uh, if you can reach that point, just fucking to the point where you're like, oh, there's so much of this, ugh, this I'm, people are throwing so much, like the Eddie Murphy thing about people just, just ch chucking pussy at him from across the street, right? That was the, that was a bit, he's not kidding. Only Hal's, that's what we'll call it, hashtag Only Hal's. Um, and I, honestly, <coughs> so... Maybe he needed a break. I think so. I think he just he was tapping out. But the point I'm trying to make is, is that um, I guarantee it was not 50 Cent, by the way. I I, I would know if it was 50 Cent because he's one of the really well-known guys. It was like, I want to say it was, it, it wasn't DMX. It was like one of the guys who's with him or something like that in his movies. But I don't know them all. So anyways, and apparently he was in there. So whatever. Anyways, the point being is that you got to hydrate. It's true. It is true. Yeah. I mean, you can do that at the same time. Like, I've used a rucksack. Never mind. Anyway, so the point is... Um, yeah, yeah. So, um, do we need to know? I don't think so, Wes. Point I'm trying to make is, is that if that guy can reach a point where he's just like, ugh, I'm tapped out, that it, for it, you to have to assault anyone... Oi. Like, I, I don't get it. I mean, I never will. So, I'm, I mean, I'm, I'll. it's a little... It, it, I guess it's a, it's a bit of a, a, it's a conundrum because I can never, I don't, I can't think in those terms. I know what it's about. I know what they, it, you know, it, and it's again, it's like why the Hamas sexual assault part where people are like, it's, they are fighting back. I'm like, no, no, there's no situation where you get an erection to prove a point about something political that happened six months or a year ago it's insane men do that because they are taking what they want in that moment or taking something from someone that's it so yeah it's it, it yeah so i like the idea that that sean combs would get to the point where he he's like let's just hurt her like is fucking mind-blowingly disgusting it's it's enraging to even think about. Like it is it's so I'm I am proud to say and happy to say it does not compute. And I'm glad that I grew up in a household and an environment and a area and a and you know perhaps all the other things that lined up so that it doesn't compute. I don't know why it would ever. But uh, but I you know. Yeah, I, I can't wrap my fucking head around it. I, you know, and and it's, oh, and the other thing is, <clears throat> this goes out to all the, uh, like, the, the maggots out there that like to call me a C-lister. First of all, C-listers and B-listers, of which I am, I'm a, I'm a B-lister, thank you very much. I'm actually an A-lister, because I get to go to the house, not the, it's not the party that I get invited to, I get invited to the house. The B-listers, getting into the best parties, that's B-list. Getting in to, to sit and have coffee and hang out, that's A-list. People get that wrong. But on, on in terms of their view of Hollywood, they always call me a you know a B or a C-list or a D-list or whatever. But they think all the A-listers eat babies, so I just take it as a compliment. Right? What, why would it be an insult um, to, to be, you know, you're not an A-lister. I'm like, well, you... You think A-listers eat babies. Why would I want to... Why, why aren't you... 
glad. Because apparently, according to them, to get from the C and B list to the A list, you have to do, you have to eat a baby or whatever, right? You have to do horrible shit. So how is it, you know, how is it ever insulting? I don't know. So it's very weird. Uh, like that part, I, don't, I that weird mix that, that doesn't, they don't seem to catch how that works. Oh, and, and, um, and so far as like, uh, Tom Hanks is an A-lister, right? Well, t- according to them, yeah, sure. Um, Tom, you know, but Tom Hanks doesn't go to these places. He's not an A-lister. He's just Tom Hanks. I once did a strip tease in front of Tom Hanks um, with Joey Lawrence. That's a long story. Should I just leave it there without any details? <laughs> It's a, I, I did a, a, for a charity cancer benefit, I did the full Monty dance with like, uh, like this choreographed, like pulled pants off kind of funny version of a striptease and Tom Hanks, uh, hosted it. <laughs> I hope people just, just clip that one part. Don't clip out the explanation that it was for charity. I was on stage and he was hosting. So technically he was backstage and he didn't, I don't even know that he watched but <laughs> I should just do that just to get famous in Hollywood. Yeah, I was, I once had to do a strip tease with Joey Lawrence in front of Tom Hanks. I'm still scarred. <laughs> That's true. I just, you have to leave it there. But yeah. Whoa. Absolutely. Um, we're getting close. Uh, Phil should be, hold on. I want to open up our thing. He should be with me in a minute. Um, and, uh, can I, can I just say that, uh, Biden is fucking killing it right now. He's just, it's amazing. Um, also the, hold on, I'm going to open up one of the things on, (laughs) what the fuck? All right. Um, I need to open this up. Yeah, Puff Joe Biden. Uh huh. Um, what's that now? What? The, here we go. Um, I right now. I mean, it's the the fucking goofiest thing. The the Kremlin wants to blame the the US and Ukraine for the attack on their theater or whatever and it's just getting so fucking lame it's it, it's like it's so ham-handed and pathetic can you please answer me when are you coming to PNW um i don't know P- PNW P- Pittsburgh no what PNW uh, Port- Portland Northwest Pacific Northwest to the Pacific Northwest we're going to be in Portland and sexyliberal.com slash tour. Uh, we, we're going to be in, uh, Port. yeah, we're going to be Portland and uh, Seattle. I would love for us to do, is that what you're asking? Yeah. Portland Sexy Liberal, yep. And uh, our dear, dear friend Tara Dublin will be there. And if I can, if we're trying to arrange a um, uh, Nerd Halen gig right before slash after that. So, hey, there's Phil in the back. Oh, very exciting. Phil's got his new his new digs. Oh shit. Yeah. Oh, yeah. This is I'm oh, this is fancy. Hold on. Um, well, hello, Mr. Fancy Pants. Um, let me see. I'm gonna I gotta put him in the in the guest thing. People are very excited about this. This is very cool. Um here you go. Um, there we go. Da, da, da. it select all there you go paste okay and then um i'm gonna pop this in and then we'll turn on his uh, that thing so we know it's there excellent um and i don't know why that's being weird now all my for some reason my my uh my little lower thirds just started acting odd just to be a jerk 
Um, but we'll put them in a second. Philip Bittner will be joining us in just one second um, from his brand new schmancy pants studios um, uh, for his. Oh, look at this. I, I like it. You're, he's moving stuff around. He's a, he's a, well, no, this is you know, it's, like the first thing. Uh, yeah, I'm very proud. It's very exciting. Here he is. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the show. Philip Bittner um, live from his studio um, on the mm -hmm. edge. It's called. Uh, this, I gotta say, looks fantastic. Uh, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm happy with the, well, it's not completely done yet. Um, a little bath, little it's, audio baffling. It's with there. Little, maybe a little, some hanging, uh, well, sound baffles. Well, this, this isn't working properly. So actually you're hearing me on my bows. Ah, on the, the old uh, or bows. On the, uh, mm -hmm. let well, me that's okay. No, you're all right. Huh. Yeah. I'm, mm -hmm. Yeah. Any better? Um, it's tinnier, but work. you're there. Yeah. All right. Okay, you're fine. Don't just leave it as it is. You'll get it up and running. I just, we just appreciate you being here. Um. By the way, howdy. How you doing? How's things? Oh, now we lost audio entirely. Oh, oh there, there we are. go. Now you're back. You're back. Yep. Uh, no. It's okay. Mm -hmm. okay. It's, it's Messing with, as I say, we got some gremlins and some bugs to work. Sure, out. Uh, fine, fine. Um, uh, you know, uh, I'm, I'm a little surprised we didn't get hit any harder than we have been. Touch wood. Um, mm -hmm. Following the the Moscow, uh, uh, the Crocus uh, attacks, mm -hmm. um, I would have thought we we got. We did get pelted pretty hard on um, Monday or Sunday or Monday. Uh, right. They they hit us pretty hard, and they've been hitting around the the country pretty hard. The Kharkiv sure. is getting a hard time. I understand. Uh, Odessa, Kherson, as usual. Um, so, mm -hmm. but Kiev wasn't hit that hard, except for that one incident where they claim to have hit. Uh, a clandestine intelligence uh, facility. Um, what they really hit was a was an art school, <laughs> right? Uh, for children, uh, and thankfully there were no children in the in the school at the time. Right. Um, but you know what, what? The other video that came out of that, though, mm -hmm. and this is just amazing. Never ceases to amaze me. Was a video came out. And you got the first. We got the video of a little cafe across the street from the children's art school, where the the barista, this twenty something, twenty one year old girl, mm -hmm. was already back at her co coffee machine with her windows blasted out. Mm -hmm. She's starting to serve coffee already, like within ten right. or fifteen minutes. And and the the reason we know this is because of like one of the first journalists to show up at the bomb site was like, "You are you making coffees?" And they're like, and she's like, "Yeah, you know, this is this we can't be stopped. You know, yeah. what, what are we gonna do? People still people still need coffee. I'm gonna right. make coffee. Absolutely. It's kind of like, oh, you can't win. Well, you know, they you had, can't win. No, they'll never win in this situation. Um, uh, no. it, you know, but there was a lot of that in. In World War II, and both uh, in England, um, certainly in France, at, at, you know, in the northern parts of France, there were these, you know, people who were like serving drinks at a bar when the entire fucking building had been blown away, but the bar was still standing. So there, you know, the the person who worked there just kind of came out of the rubble and went, "All right, anybody want a drink?" And they just started yeah. pouring drinks for people um, from it. Um, so Zelensky visited the um, uh, the Sumy Oblast. Um, let's see if I get this in here. Yeah, there he is. Um, uh, this week, inspecting you know the fortifications and all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. And uh, and I gotta say, this shit. You, yeah. Just even looking at this stuff, like they're not fucking around. The 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 Russian stuff, even if even though they had, you could argue, as much time as the Ukrainians to create this shit, um, they're not. There's they're just digging holes and because they and filling them in with bodies. Mm -hmm. 
They're not anywhere near the kind of coordinated shaping of this. And I've, you know, from all the videos I've seen of where Ukrainians come across, you know, a, a trench full of Russians and they're throwing grenades in after them or shooting at them or any of that shit, like it just looks like garbage. And this is, they're like, nope, we got the real deal. Um, and so he's yeah, he, he's out there much, yeah, yeah, and, and much more hospitable. I mean, that's not a small thing. I'm not. No, being, I'm not being flippant about it. It's, it's much more hospitable for their soldiers so that they can survive in the elements. You, mm -hmm. You're out in the elements in those trenches. The one thing that well, the one thing that the, 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 there are a couple things the Russians did better in their establishment of a defensive line. Um, and we'll, we'll see how the Ukrainians do. But the, the Russians were very good in laying mines. Yeah, because they had. They had warehouses of these things, so right. and they don't care. So they just they just threw mines everywhere. You know, it's, mm -hmm. it, this land is the most. Uh, I saw I saw a uh, an estimate that uh, Ukraine is now the most uh, mined or the 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 the, the land the, the country with the most unexploded explosive uh, you know uh, munitions uh, yeah. in, in the world, whether it's mines shells. That haven't been detonated, or et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. There is no place on Earth that has more unexploded ordnance than Ukraine right now, which is mm -hmm. incredibly depressing. But that's how the Russians operate. Right. And then they also did, um, they also did, uh, you know, anti-tank uh, lines. So while they're their men, they don't care about how their men live. They'll they'll throw them in muddy pits, sure, and just you know, you just sleep next to the toilet and. It's just the, they're living the quality of life for those poor guys. I say it's poor just septic. Guys, those guys is yeah. septic, yeah. but they were good at setting up defensive lines to obstruct an offensive, uh, a, a Ukrainian offensive. So they were good with mines. They were good with dragon's teeth, those concrete uh, pyramid things, which which you know uh, obstructs uh, armor. Um, mm -hmm. They did that very well, and they were able to do that in no small measure because we, again, you know, the argument has been made, and I think it's rel. I think it's it's you know uh, it's true mm -hmm. um, that you know we we gave we didn't give them the long range artillery last spring and summer to disrupt the Russians from being able to put those that infrastructure in, so right. that when that vaunted Ukrainian offensive happened and the one where by the way there was still no air superiority no nato general would ever go into the the kind of war that we were asking ukraine to go into to go to, yeah that they yeah they ran into it they ran into a brick wall and they ran into every you know just just a a, a huge pile of ex, uh, unexploded mines and grenades and right traps and booby traps and all the rest of it so but uh, as you're looking at the Sumi, you know, the battlefield circulation is what those things are called. When a, mm -hmm. when a guy comes and kind of just takes stock of the, of yeah. the situation, um, those are complete. Those are meant for your soldiers. Yes. That the priority there is that Ukrainian soldiers have defensive lines from which they can defend themselves and they can live like human beings so right. that they don't they don't fall victim to illness they don't fall victim to you know just despair or all the rest of it that you know russian soldiers just get treated like dirt yeah no i mean i think for their i i have to say when i when i'm president i would if, if i were ever in a situation where there is an open war someplace or whatever it would be um one of the things i i might be keen to do if, it, if it's even possible, is to eat the same food the troops are eating for the the entire time the war is going on. And yeah. that, even that, even well, that. we have a like, tradition, yeah, we have a tradition sharing, of something yeah. similar to that. In the, in right. the United States military, there mm -hmm. is often during holidays, yep. uh, particularly uh, things like Memorial Day or Veterans Day mm -hmm. or July 4th, there's a tradition in the U.S. military for uh, a swapping of roles with the officer corps and the enlisted men that all, so you'll see colonels, generals, mm -hmm. the top brass will go into mess halls and they will serve the enlisted men. 
It's a mm -hmm. it's a common traditional thing, but it sets that precedent that you're talking about. Yeah. Of like, know what your soldiers are going through and and have empathy for them because those guys are the ones that uh, that are doing mm -hmm. the heavy lifting and um, and you got to show them respect. So um, Jenny in our chat Phil. is saying, oh, yeah, I want to connect Noah Phil Sims. with a chef named Noah yeah. Sims. He's helped feed Ukraine in yep. alignment with. Uh, hold on, let me bring it back up. Uh, Rachel Ray's organization. I had the pleasure of working with him. He said he also brought toys for kids and snuck in some drones. <laughs> um, well, yeah. do you, do, send me a DM. DM me on uh, on Twitter or what have okay, you. Okay, yeah. Um, I do better in Congress. Well, I, I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna stay executive, guys. I'm going like my goal is uh, mayor, governor, president. That would be the or you know city hall mayor, governor, president. That arc, as opposed to the you know the inside the beltway version, which is fine. Okay. Um, apparently, sorry, Linda, gotta still, have, gotta have still no comments from Linda. Um, uh, Linda still has no comment. Um, all right. Anyways, uh, the, uh, <laughs> um, I wanted to show this to you as well. And um, by the way, Lev Parnas is going to be my guest. I'm doing a third hour today. I heard. Yeah. I it's heard. very cool. I'd, I'd and, like to stay on and say hello if I could. Yeah. Well, you'll be in the, you know, be in the room or whatever. He'll be able to see you and you can say hi all you would like while I'm setting it up and everything. Um, sure. and then oh. maybe we'll, uh, try and slap you in there. But, um, this is, uh, this is the current number of, uh, mm -hmm. Russian losses as of March 27th, 439,190 troops, just a thousand thirty since yesterday. Think what you were doing, everybody last night, uh, I don't know, around 9 PM and know that st from then till now, um, 1,030 Russians have died or been horribly injured so as to never be able to return to the battlefield. Um, I, I do not have sympathy for, uh, what they are doing, but the cost of human life, the, the, the just abject disregard for human life that Vladimir Putin has is the stark, uh, shocking aspect of that number. Um, yeah, to some degree, yeah. fuck them. But it, on the other end, like a bunch of these guys are like immigrants that are scooped up or people who were, you know, uh, I don't, I don't have any particular trust in, in the Russian legal system for one. I mean, just look at the, the bullshit around the four guys that they caught, whether that's true or not, they're all beaten into saying whatever the fuck they needed them to say. Right. Um, that a bunch of people wouldn't go, I'm in here you know, for trumped up charges and bullshit because some oligarch just wanted my girlfriend or some shit or his son did. And so I get thrown in jail for six years and I can fight in the war and then get out. Maybe I can just, you know, once they release me, I could just run. And then he finds out, nope, they'll shoot you if you run. So he's stuck there getting trench foot and, and dies. That guy is a victim of circumstance in some ways. Right. Um, yeah. and there are, yeah. there is a statistically significant number of those fellows. In other wars, there would not be. Yeah, and th and they're going to be more because uh, I would be willing to put money mm -hmm. uh, down that uh, Putin is going to have another mobilization. It won't right. make a difference, right? Um, because you can keep throwing bodies at this, but you know it's not going to change not a fucking win. thing, it's the, no, right? It's not I agree. It's. I mean, and again, that's sort it of the looks like. Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. No, go ahead. I was going to say, um, uh, it doesn't change the sort of brutality of the circumstance um, in, in terms of, you know, what's happening to people on both sides. He's he because he's there's not going to be an impact on him until it's too late. You know, it's like that arc you're always talking about. Nothing happens until everything happens. And until that moment, yeah. it, it's no skin off his nose to just, you know, kick these assholes into the ravine, you know, into the into the yeah. canyon. And when, when the worm turns, it will turn suddenly and mm -hmm. he will, it, it, I, you know, he will, he's going to end in a nasty uh, it, a way. It's his fate is not going to be good. Mm -hmm. uh, but the question is, the question is, you know, is it, is it a palace coup where the, the, uh, the internal power structure within Moscow replaces him? Uh, you know, and the next thing you know, he is stuck at his 
you know, mansion down in Sochi is kind of like Napoleon at Elba, right? You know, or exiled all Pol Pot, basically, uh, or a like, Pol Pot, yeah, or yeah. you know, or is he, or, um, or will it be he's in, you know, he's suddenly chucked into a Russian prison, uh, and they go through that kind of whole, um, you know, Kabuki theater uh, aspect mm-hmm. of it, but is it internally within the power structure in Russia, or is it a popular uprising? And if it's a popular uprising, it will not be like, it will not be Boris Yeltsin on a tank right. in Moscow. It will be 1917 again. It'll be blood. It'll be yeah. a lot of blood, which is scary. Yeah. You know, and we should be concerned about that. You know, but- we've been we, we've been dealing with the kind of linguistic point of no return in terms of how, you know, we're, we're dealing with Russia. At a certain point, there was this like, give them a give them an off ramp, give them a landing strip so that they can kind of get away from this stuff. And that when it's abundantly clear that they're not going to, the language has definitely changed. It's the same with China, the way Biden is dealing with China. There, if, if you ask him, he'll just fucking tell you the truth. That's the great thing about Biden is that, and it's rough for his people, I'm sure. <laughs> but he's like, even the Taiwan thing, they're like, would you defend Taiwan militarily if, uh, if China tech? Uh-huh. <laughs> yes, we would. Yep. And everybody's like, well, I mean, technically speaking, we would, but there's a pact of, you know, they're all tap dancing, but it, that's exactly what would happen. And he's totally, absolutely being yeah. like direct as he should be as a leader. Um, but the this week, um, Biden in talking about, you know, budgetary issues, talked about how we could fund helping Ukraine, um, you know, and, you know, because he was talking about like a tax on, on billionaires, if they were paying 25% of, by the way, of their profits, not of their worth, not of what they take in for the year, not what it costs them to do business. 25% of profit for a, a tax, which is like even in a rate close to upper middle class. Um, he's like, you know what we could do with that money? This is a Biden quote. Imagine what we could do with that. We could do so many things, consequential, including finally making sure that we take care of Ukraine from that butcher Putin. And, and calling <laughs> calling Ukraine, calling Putin a calling fucking the head of Russian- butcher. The Russian Federation of Butcher. Good for him. Yep. Good for him. Yeah. He's now right. I called him. He's in, right. In, he's and that was that was uh, at a um, uh, let's see. He was um, where was he? I, I want to say he was uh, talking to basically like a campaign event kind of thing. But he was, um, you know, in February he, there was like this uh, hot mic thing during a fundraising event or whatever where he you know he called him a crazy son of a bitch. Um, yeah. Which I also think applies. You know, because this was, you know, it was a private fundraiser. This is a campaign event. He's yeah. like, he, he's calling him a butcher and a crazy son of a bitch. And he's absolutely right. He's both of those things. That is true. Fuck the gaff machine nonsense we hear about Biden all the time. Sometimes he's his gaffes are him just telling the truth. Just like gay marriage. Yes. If you'll recall, when when there was all the debate about gay marriage versus civil unions and the, and the Obama, it, like, campaign was like, we're going to come out for civil unions because we don't, you know, tactically, the country's not there yet. If you poll the country, they're not ready for marriage, but they are supportive. 75% are for civil unions. So we'll say we're for civil unions and eventually we can get to marriage and we can argue that later, but at least people will have their fucking rights. And we'll just, you know, you got to kind of be political in some of these things. And then they interview Biden and he's like, of course they should be allowed to get married. And they're like, you know, the whole White House is that way. But he was right. And they should. And fuck you. Well, what, and, and that, wasn't, that, that, wasn't that kind of Sudeikis? Wasn't that kind of Sudeikis' take on on Jason Sudeikis when he would play uh, Biden back mm-hmm. in the day as vice president at SNL? That Sudeikis would always portray him as like, you know, straight shooting. I mean, I, I'm, you know, yeah. you never well, know what was, I'm going to say, what's going to come out of my mouth. Well, that's because uh, yeah he had a repu- and he has a rightful reputation of of speaking right maybe, well it's like you know, a little too bluntly sometimes right you know, for, for the Obama for politics right but he's talking like a senator yeah. is what he's doing because senators and and yes. and house members can shit talk sometimes and not as you know vice president there's a lot more weight on it and he just had that hadn't caught up with him yet and it, I don't think it ever will really they just that's why he goes I'm gonna get in trouble if I stay out here and answer questions what he means is I'm going to start calling you dumb fuckers out 
And that's clearly yeah. it. It's like that moment when it would, uh, Peter Ducey, Ducey is asking him a question and he goes Ducey. like this. And he's like, oh, this motherfucker. And and people look at it like he's tired and failing at him. And you're like, motherfucker, he's just trying not to call him a dumb motherfucker to his face. Um, and and that like well, he and, got, and another hot mic, another hot mic moment when he was like, uh, what a dumb guy, son of a bitch. You know? Yeah, right. So it's it, it, this is a um, you know. Meanwhile, as we go along, let me try to uh, bring this up or whatever. Currently, um, a third so far of uh, Russia's Black Sea fleet it has been sunk mm-hmm. or crippled. Yep. Um, and it, Poland has warned that if their missiles that they fire into Western Ukraine get too close to them, Poland will shoot them down. Which is, well, a, uh, which is a good thing, but gets yeah. very, into a very well, like sketchy uh, well, because, zone. Also because them. Poland, Poland yeah. just recently had a little bit of an embarrassment about that, <clears throat> where they they admitted right. that a Russian uh, Russian uh, <clears throat> um, uh, cruise missile mm-hmm. was inside their airspace because one of these kind of right. missiles that like does the does kind of like loiter in place kind of thing until it finds a target or what have you or until it gets better instructions and directions and what have you right um that apparently was inside polish airspace for a full minute uh mm-hmm. and that the response to that has been hey poland <laughs> what are you doing Mm-hmm. You know, uh, so I would not be surprised if they if they crack down on that. And the next time a Russian uh, missile comes even close to violating Polish airspace, that they'll that they'll react in a very different way. Because mm-hmm. and rightfully, and, look, if I was a pole, yeah, if I was a pole right now. I would I'd want be Russian like, missiles crossing sorry, my airspace. <laughs> yeah. Right. There was a Russian missile above me for a full minute. Right. But, you know. Yeah. Especially the shit that uh, uh, Solovyev and and uh, Semyon have been talking about. Yeah, Semyon. They've been talking about Poland all this fucking time. No. Uh, Um, uh, So they, uh, the, I guess the, first of all, there's like a, an addition of funds that came from the most budget, the most recent budget that got through. And um, we have been coordinating apparently Blinken's made another uh, talk, and, and uh, this is where they're doing this, like, kind of NATO bounce around. Apparently, they're like, okay, um, there seems to be a tipping point with everybody's populace about what they'll deal with as far as cost, you know, where the, where the you know, the Russians will rush in with this info and fuck with everybody and cause, you know, disruptions. So when you get close to that number, somebody else will take the heat. And then you get close to that number, somebody else will take the heat. And that's the way of, like, making them chase the fucking whack-a-mole of, of, support. And so Blinken, you know, you know how like uh Kasim Soleimani got credit for coordinating Hezbollah and Hamas and all these groups and putting them together to kind of squeeze Israel was the, you know, it's not he didn't invent the tactic, but he really nailed down these kind of Iranian subgroups to go after Israel as proxies. There's kind of a a, a support for uh Ukraine version of that going on, which is just Okay, we'll give them as much as we can. And then when everybody starts to balk, you guys give them as much as you can. And then by the time it comes around our turn again, the the sentiment has gone down. And that seems yeah. to be the circle that's happening. And so uh, Macron just stated, I think, that they were... I want to get this in here. They, um, they, they're they sending a bunch of stuff to uh, like the Czech Republic or something to bounce the stuff through to Ukraine because that's mm-hmm. the new thing too. Yeah, well. that's like, the other thing they're doing. Yeah, that's the other thing they're doing. Yeah, which is to backfill mm-hmm. somebody else, mm-hmm. and then and then a population like Poland or the Czechs or the Baltic states, which have a, 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 a taller threshold and tolerance for supporting Ukraine. Right. That in, so the French can backfill the Czechs or the Estonians or whatever, and mm-hmm. the Estonians or the Czechs or whomever who recognize and who very, very cognizant of the threat from Moscow. Yeah. That those can be the guys sending stuff and we'll just do this kind of seemingly innocuous backfill, which is a, another tactic. Look, whatever it takes. Yep. Whatever it takes. To, and I have, and I have heard it's anecdotal at this point 
-hmm. but I have heard from people who are uh, up on the front lines that some munitions have started to flow, that they are starting to receive um, more mm -hmm. shells, which is really, it's artillery shells that they need. Right. Not exclusively, but that's one of the, one of the big things that they need to have is, is to be able to call down artillery when these waves of Russian soldiers come up, come over uh, and they've been running really, really, really low. Um, but within the last week or so, I've been hearing reports from people who go up there to provide humanitarian aid, medical aid, um, different logistical support that there's it, that something is in the air, that there is a change out mm -hmm. there and that things are starting to arrive. Let's hope that's right. true. Let's hope that that doesn't, you know, let's hope that that isn't uh, just a, you know, a, a temporary thing that it actually is from here escalating. Um, there's not a doubt in my mind that Congress will is going to look, they're going to pass the aid package. Yep. They're Agreed. going to get $60 billion one way or the other mm -hmm. six. But the problem is, you know, how long can the Ukrainians wait? And the weather is changing. We are, we are definitely in spring today was lovely in, uh, in, in Kiev. I, I took a nice little stroll and, um, mm -hmm. you know, didn't, didn't, it was, it was, you know, spring has sprung or is okay. in the process of spring, which means there's also going to be an increase in fighting. So, you know, we'll see how that goes. The F-16 should be here any minute. I mean, they're, they're, if they're not already here and we don't know, mm -hmm. um, but, uh, I think the F-16, look, mm -hmm. I don't, I never said, I never thought the Abrams, for example, was going to be a game changer here. I knew that the Bradley was going to be a big deal because I've right. been in Bradley's. I've, yep. I've been in combat in Bradley's before, and I know what an amazing system those things are. Right. Um, I knew the. I, I knew from people I deeply respect within the military that the HIMARS would be a would be a game changer, and they were. Um, when the F 16s get here, the air war is going to change significantly. Yep. Because I do, well, we're going to have to wait and see. Um, some of, you know, Russia's fourth generation and fifth generation fighters are going to be also, I mean, they may not put fifth generation uh, stuff out there because the, the, the Russians tend to be kind of holding their best stuff back. Right. For a variety of speculated uh, reasons. Um, so we'll have to see how the F-16 fares against Russian jets, but... I think, mm -hmm. from what I understand, and from people who are far more knowledgeable about this than I am, that the F-16 is going to be a big deal when, well, they, yeah. when, they, when they're really here. Well, And, and, and they're um, going to be here soon. There seems to be a lead up. I want to show you something real quick. Um, this is from another... Bit of, uh, um, this is a... I'll play this real quick. Um, ah, this, yeah. yeah, this is one of the... That's is that the bombing in uh, Sevastopol? Yeah. Am I looking at Crimea? I believe so. Yeah. Um, and um, they they managed to hit if they you see them there yeah, like a I follow up this. of something else that got hit. Um, like you can hear you can see them kind of other yeah these these other strikes at the yep. same time, and they're hitting these infrastructure, um, you know stuff, but you know these uh, like refineries or ammo depots, but they're not hitting these buildings. See the lights on in the civilian areas? See that part of it? Yeah. That's that's the part that's fucking crucial to this. Look at all the lit up places yep. in this area and look at the dark like spots that they're actually hitting. It's because they have they are picking their targets specifically to avoid killing human beings who don't have it coming, who aren't guarding ammo for the for the assault or yeah. aren't participating in the assault. All these lights are still on. They're not just blowing up the electrical grid just for the fuck of it. That's the other thing too. They're not like hitting the Russians do. Right. Exactly. And that that is an I mean Kharkiv Kharkiv right now apparently Kharkiv is really struggling with their with 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 energy. So right. and that's that's just that that is a that is attacking uh the civilian populace. Right. Uh, that is 
That makes the lights go out There's in the hospitals. No military objective. For the, yep. for the yep. only the reason, and the, the only reason is right. make the lights go out in the hospital. That's the only reason they're doing it. Yep. Make their, uh, make their lives hell so that they we break their spirit, not understanding that that is right. not going to happen. But also, it's interesting, you, you know, to notice that also um, in like Belgorod, when mm -hmm. when in when the when uh, Russian uh kind of rebel so separatist groups anti-putin russian forces that were yeah. supported by ukraine crossed the border went to into uh the city of belgorod mm -hmm. um in, in russia proper so they took the fight on the other side of the border they sent out a message to the citizens and the residents of belgorod hey we're mm -hmm. going to be coming get out get mm -hmm. out of the city and the russians would not let the civilians leave they turned them around they set up checkpoints and they turned the residents of the city around so these these groups that were attacking the city um mm -hmm. you know if there was collateral damage in many ways the the fault well, lies a, with russian authorities there is a there is a reason why uh the russians yes. have been meeting and working with hamas literally um, the hamas leaders flew to moscow mm -hmm in in mm -hmm. uh, you know in the weeks before October 7th and then right afterwards they were trying to broker this bullshit version of peace on their terms which would uh, it create like connective tissues never going to pass so that's the point is you put something forward that you know isn't going to pass and then blame the other side for not bending to your will Russia does this all the fucking time and so they did the exact yeah. same thing with by the way the same fucking people. They brought these Hamas leaders there to uh, to do this exact same thing. And none of them, there is no, uh, you know, the Russians are not dropping leaflets in Odessa or anywhere else saying, hey, we're going to bomb these buildings. You've got 24 hours to get the fuck out of here. And, and Hamas doesn't, uh, you know, f send a, a paper rocket made out of a sewer pipe you know, or attached to a sewer pipe that says, hey, we're going to, the next one we send is going to land on something real. They don't care. They just flail them at, at civic areas. There's a difference yeah. and there has to be a difference. And the idea that there you know, there is no difference, again, means you're bringing a fire extinguisher to a flood if you're trying to solve the problem. There's so many of these things where you, we can agree that there's a problem, but we have to agree on what the problem is and what the solution is. Otherwise, it, it you know, you know, it, it, just because you're a hammer doesn't mean everything's a nail. It just means you think everything's a nail. And and in terms of Russia, they think everything's a fucking nail. You know. That's a yeah. that's a a rough front for them. I okay, so uh in um in the next hour I wanted to discuss a little bit with you because I'm going to be talking to um Lev Parnas in the next hour. And I'm very excited about this because I've been, you know, following this story oh, and no, yeah great he's been yeah he's been doing no, some great stuff great that you're gonna talk to him but yeah. he was also not allowed to share some of his information at the you know at the time certainly with the january 6th committee you know not in a timely fashion where it could be you know argued out in public which was part of what trump wanted but the sort of hinky nature of pre what i would call pre-hunter corruption pre-Biden corruption in Ukraine versus post-Biden Ukraine. And there's a very distinct yeah. difference. Yes, am I, uh, I mean, in my studies and what I've looked into, they that they seem to have turned a fucking corner after the Euromaidan and then, you know, maybe not, you know, you know, Poroshenko was, again, a transition candidate, but certainly under Zelensky, you know, yeah, it, and they and they had a, yeah. it, that was a really weird period of time in, mm -hmm. in and and I, I would be interesting I would be interested in hearing what Lev has to say if you bring it up with him is that I equate that period uh, the Maidan up until uh, the full scale invasion mm -hmm. um, as this kind of Casablanca right situation in 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 particular in Kiev because you had all these different i mean like the russian embassy was open here yeah you know they the, the russians were operating in the city um operating in the capital of ukraine even while there was fighting in donbass and minsk and all the rest of it 
So they had all these machinations were happening. Um, and you're right. They, the Ukrainians were trying to crack down on corruption. Mm -hmm. um, but at the same time, there were Russian elements operating in the city that were trying to foment corruption because right. that's how they live. Right. And, and they want Ukraine to be a failed state. And Kiev to be a failed uh, capital. Well, the, you know, you do. Uh, so it is a, is a particular. That's the, yeah. that's the atmosphere. That's the atmosphere in, in which Lev Parnas mm. was coming here. This kind of Casablanca, Vichy France, mm. um, you know, but Nazi Germany and every expat from around the world. You know, that kind of that atmosphere is the world in which Lev came and which Giuliani was coming and meeting with with various uh you know shady Russian intelligence operatives right. and corrupt oligarchs this place was a hotbed for that kind of stuff and I, I'd be interested to hear Lev's kind of he, if he kind of had the same impression of of what was happening in this city in that weird limbo period between Maidan and the full-scale invasion, when Russians were still tolerated here, even though everybody knew that they were they were trying to destroy uh, right. Ukraine, but you know they 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 were trying to find this way forward, and it was it created a very bizarre city mm -hmm. and a very bizarre sort of set of circumstances. So. It's not a surprise that Le, you know that Parnas and Julian would come here, seeking these ploys and these you know digging up dirt and all the rest of it, because this place was filled with operatives and filled with people doing lots of hinky stuff. Yeah. So it'll be interesting to hear what he has to say. But it's it's great you're talking to him. Yeah. Um, you know, because I, I thank him for thank him for his. Thank yeah. you for uh, well. I'll, I'll, if I can get a word in with him in the transition, I'll do it myself. Yeah, but yeah. If I'm not able to, thank him for what he did up on the hill. That was yeah. That was great. And naming names, I mean, fantastic. Yeah. Well, especially when it comes to Ron Johnson and and Jeff Sessions. Um, oh, you know, I holy know. shit! Like so that good. that so the good. unpacking of Ron Johnson's entire situation. Because I like again with some of these folks, <clears throat> like uh like Marjorie Taylor Greene, for example. I think the idea that they are 95% fucking stupid and 5%, you know, maybe they're fucking around with us, but they're better than those guys is their reason of sucking up to, you know, or appreciating Putin or any of that kind of shit. Right. Um, yeah. and the, the other, um, I'll do what I can. Wiffle poof. It's it might be a question of bandwidth. Um, but, um, so I, for, for me, I, I like looking at this sort of, mishmash and Trump world of, of where he was and Trump's like history. I kind of, I read the chat, I lost what I was talking about, but this is more important. The um, Trump's history with Russian money and it, and that sort of what you're talking about, Vichy France kind of Casablanca shit that was going on in Ukraine and Russia, which were basically the same from a corruption territorial aspect. Ukrainian corruption at that time was, Russian corruption. It was rooted in mm -hmm. the Russian and that they don't need, oh, this is what I was going to put, that they don't need it to work. They just need the chaos. It does, even the fraud and the fuck around that they have, it's better if you get busted and people need to be warned about that. People like, in, if you're, if you're in Trump's world or orbit and you're thinking of playing footsie with these motherfuckers, know that at some point it works for them if you end up going to jail because it speaks about the excesses of the West and the shitty American system and everybody's mobbed up and it's all, everybody's fraudulent. So the more news it makes, the better, right? Yeah. So, yeah. And, and the other, the, the other problem with, and this is, you know, what, and as I progress and grow my podcast out, another guy I want to talk to is Ben Browder. Yeah. You know who is who is an expert on this kind of uh, mm -hmm. the problem is because in Russia for for sure, but in mm -hmm. the former Soviet Union and the kind of larger 
<clears throat> Russian Empire, the sphere of influence and kind of the, the lands that they infected with their system, mm -hmm. system in quotation marks. Um, it's part and part, corruption is baked into it. Uh, mm -hmm. We don't even, they don't even consider it corruption. It is their, it is their standard operating procedure. It is mm -hmm. how things are done is by, <clears throat> um, forget law, forget, forget ethics, forget everything. Power yeah. is what matters. Influence, zero sum binary, I win, you lose. That kind of mentality is, <clears throat> and if it means that I have to hire a hitman, or if it means that I have to, you know, beg, borrow, steal, whatever it takes, uh, I'm going to do it. It's it's the air they breathe. It's the water they swim in. Right. So by if you are a Westerner um, who operates in a system where there is law and there even when law is broken or morals mm -hmm. are broken or ethics are broken, there's, you know, in it, when it works properly, there are repercussions for that. Mm -hmm. In Russia, there's none of that, right? None of that. In fact, that kind of mentality is seen as naive. It is seen as as foolish and um, uh, you know hypocritical mm -hmm. because ultimately we're all just going to fall back on being brutes and animals because that's who we are in our right. very basic nature. That's their mentality. So they can't. If you get involved with Russians or if you come to a place. Uh, like say Kiev in that interim period where all this craziness was happening, and if you if you get involved with these guys, you're going to be getting involved in what we would consider corruption. They don't even think about it as corruption, but yeah. you will be getting involved in what we would consider. So Browder's very good about that. I I, I suspect Lev will be very good about that. Mm -hmm. But corruption isn't, I mean, that it's not even considered corruption. It's just how things are done in Russia. So, you know, coming, uh, you make the point about, would you rather, uh, you know, invest in Burisma before or after um, Hunter Biden was involved? Well, of course after, because right. prior it was run like so much of what was run in, in Kiev it was at the behest and control of Moscow. This is why Biden, I don't understand why this is so difficult for people to understand, but Biden was a signator. He was a, he was a guarantor on a loan. Right. That's his whole thing. Anybody who was taken out of the third party or has had a third party sign on to, maybe when you were a kid and yeah. you, you, you wanted the, the first down payment on your house or whatever it was. And you, mm -hmm. and your parents came in because their credit st scores were better than yours and they will sign as a guarantee. That's the only, so all of this, like Hunter didn't have any qualifications to be in an oil company. He didn't have to, right. He didn't have, well, it was, he was trading on his name. Well, yeah, because the guys who came here from Moscow would just disappear. Right. They would when they got into hot water, when when things started looking bad for them, they could always just take Bug all their out. money, hop in a car, get on a train, get on a Learjet, fly back to Moscow, and you're never gonna what, face any reason. One need only look at Hunter yeah. Biden can't just disappear. Yeah. No, he can't. And his and his dad would always be on the hook for that stuff. Uh, Yanukovych. Exactly. I mean, it, Yanukovych's like disappearance, you know, and move into Russia after. Perfect example. A, a, in Euromaidan. Holy shit. Like they, they, like he was traveling by truck and then they got him on a small plane and then the, the Ukrainian government grounded the plane because he was going to face charges. And then they put it, they grounded the plane, but there was another Russian plane waiting for him there. And they flew below the radar into Russian territory. And the dude's been hiding in Russia ever fucking since. And people are going to tell me that we started a coup in fucking Ukraine. If Jesus Christ, why why would he flee to in that way to there? He wasn't going to be killed. He was just going to be tried. He was just going to be on trial. Like it's and yet the like that story is as fucking. It reminds me of like a early '90s fucking 007 movie. You know what I mean? Where like planes are meeting in a you know in a sketchy airfield yeah. on a piece of abandoned highway and people swap out and then the plane blows up in the air um, and it's, you know, without you on it. 
It reeked of that for fuck's sake. Um, so yeah, it's and, it's and after, by the way, not 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 to get distracted or to go down another um, uh, line of, of of discussion, but after for all of your friends, if your friends ever say, "Oh yeah, the, the coup, the coup, the coup, the coup," mm-hmm. the legislative body voted out uh, uh, Yanukovych yes. before he he right. fled after the Rada unanimously because he had just killed 107 people right by sicking his thug security forces on them and don't tell don't let anybody tell you that they did it to themselves that's mm-hmm. not true um you know yanukovych killed 107 of his own people the rada the legislative body gets together and completely within their power says he's gone we're voting him out that's when he flees Right. So we didn't, you know, it's, it's, and also in addition to that, everybody knew, everybody in this city knew, and everybody in Ukraine knew that one of their biggest, the one of the biggest impediments to development and reform was Russia. The sooner that they, you kick out the malign, in, you know, influence of Russia, that only then would Ukraine flourish so whether it was yanukovych or some other sock puppet leader that that you know kuchma from the very beginning you know right um uh, that the moscow has been a spoiler in ukraine yeah. for a long long time and they and whether or not it was it was yushinko reneging on the deal to make a trade agreement with europe and taking moscow's money instead or killing his own people, or whatever it was that there. Mm-hmm. This was this was uh, always going to be a split. This right. divorce was coming uh, for a long for a long time because Ukrainians don't want to live like that. They have a huge problem with corruption here, mm-hmm. but it's never going to get better until you expel the malign interests of, of Moscow and. That's where we're getting to, and it, it'll be interesting to hear your discussion with Levin. I'm, I'm gonna, I'll, 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 you know, I'll listen in, obviously. But yeah, uh, uh, it, it, it's I think he should really be on your, because he could, he'd be a great guest on uh, on the edge. Your I new would like podcast. Uh, well, indeed, uh, indeed, yeah. and I would, and and if you would be so kind as to extend an invitation on my behalf, absolutely. Uh, or if I get a chance to say it myself, I will. Feel free. But, yeah, It'll take me a minute talk, to get him I want to talk, plugged in, as you know. So sure, feel I want free. To talk to people, I want to talk to people like 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 uh, Lev. Mm-hmm. I want to talk to Bill Browder. I want to talk to to General uh, Ben Hodges, who I I know from my Iraq day. So I'm confident that I can. Get, I want to talk to prominent Ukrainian voices, people mm-hmm. who are involved in rescuing children from from Russian captivity. That's an right. interview that I'm. Uh, that I'm working on securing. I'm, I want right. to talk to, you know, legislators. I want to talk to cultural uh, people about how the society and the culture and the, uh, uh, you know, and how art is is affecting uh, people who are resisting, um, you know, the the difficulties. Uh, uh, you know, when, when you art is a great way of of releasing the tension. So maybe a mu- you know, I've got a, a friend of a friend who knows a very prominent musician here. I just mm-hmm. I want to. Uh, I want to use the podcast as a platform to interview people who have um, who have uh, strong voices, uh, influence, uh, perspectives that you don't know, normally hear. Um, and um, and I'm as it stands now, my intention is to do, uh, and we'll see how this goes. So don't hold me to this if it, if sure. it doesn't turn out this way, but. Is to do what once a week an interview and then once a week uh, kind of like a synopsis of the week's news and kind of my take on on things and my analysis of, of, of um, I'm not going to do it daily, but maybe a weekly sum, uh, summation uh, and then a weekly interview that and then I still want to get out and about yeah um, so I'm still going to be vlogging but um, and and also. You know, setting up this facility, I'm also going to be talking to other, you know, Ukrainian podcasters and journalists and, um, you know, uh, the dollar goes a long way here. So uh, mm-hmm. if I'm able to set up a facility that can that can keep Ukraine in people's mm-hmm. minds and, and, and you know, put forward 
Ukrainian voices, then I'm all for it. So mm-hmm. um, I think I, I'm I'm glad that you're going to be talking to Lev. I think that's fantastic yeah. that you yeah. secured an interview with him because he's a, you know, he's a he his he will he will outline for you much of what we have. He will reinforce much of yeah. what we have discussed. Sure. Um, since since you and I have been collaborating with now two and a half years, almost three years. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, because we started talking before the war started. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but uh, he will he will back up. Uh, I think with a lot of, of what I said because, um, mm-hmm. he 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 will understand the danger and the corruption and yeah. the risk to everybody, everybody who believes in liberal democracy, who believes in the rule of law, who believes in, um just you know uh, a system that isn't built on um, mm-hmm. binary power and just um, you know all the things that Ru- the, the, the the world that Russia envisions is not a very pleasant yeah. one in my opinion and I, I know which side of the fence I'm on on that and I suspect love will back that up yeah. that he'll he'll reiterate that it th- there is a very real threat from a country out there that abhors, everything that we believe in because right. it is an anathema to them their idea is law um power politics yeah uh, all of it is only a veneer is only a tool to be used to exert power and control it's a very cynical worldview that's the alternative that they present to us because that they make the comp, they they make the criticism of our system that is h- hypocrisy and naivete that all of these things that we we think are so important are just window dressing and at the end of the day you're just like us you're just as brutal and as cruel and we in the west have to make a decision of you know we may fail at what we try to achieve on a regular basis and there might mm-hmm. be cynicism and disappointment but by god at least we keep trying the alternative that the moscovites offer us is it's yeah. just it's not well it's, it's not, not civilization any kind of world i want to live in it's not no, civilization it's, not. it's brutality yeah it's, right it's barbaric um, it's barbarism oh with uh, the thin veneer of civilization thank you andrea appreciate that um lev's going to be about 15 minutes late they said which is fine we'll get there so okay. you can hang around for a little bit on this because I, I, I can hang around for you yeah, a absolutely longer. excellent sure, um and boston brian is here hey boston brian uh welcome everybody check out boston brian show as well sundays he live streams i'm just saying and then um uh this is um uh, you know i i've been fascinated by the it's this weird you know this it's such a weird mix of things in that we have in, in my lifetime, and I'm sure you've experienced this, from, I, I guess, post-Kennedy assassination on, um, and I talked about this yesterday on the show, about the, the, the sort of, this idea of the rise of the conspiracy theorist. And I would argue that most of the people we're talking about as conspiracy theorists, like Alex Jones or Russell Brand or any of these assholes, or even Jimmy Dore, who there are actually conspiracists. That they are engaged in in a philosophy of conspiracism. They make them up out of whole cloth. They they either through ignorance, belligerence, or a combination of the two, or absolute ab, outright lying, fabricate this like the, these links so that they can sell the end times to a bunch of dupes that they can sell cans of beans to. And so it's not that they have conspiracy theories. They engage in conspiracizing facts they 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 instead of going i saw this fact i saw a, i saw a fact and b fact and c fact and i because i'm smarter than uh they'll they'll allow you to be i put these three things together and i saw the truth that would be um what i would call a conspiracy theorist at, at its best conspiracism is going this scares people this detail scares people this detail scares people they're not linked but if I link them together, it terrifies people. So it's sort of a form of stochastic terrorism. And it's and you can do it because you're a fucking paranoid asshole like Roseanne, where you your brain automatically links things that are not linked into this terror web. 
in your head that's just supposed to scare the living shit out of it. And the, the ad absurdum end of it is garbage, but it's very frightening to dipshits like you. And, or that, you know, you're making money off of it. Like, like Alex is where you just go. I, I, well, I found, it, it, yeah. it, it, it lets it, it, you're, you're absolutely right that it, it, it brings order to a, a, a world that can often be chaotic or seen to be mm-hmm. chaotic. <clears throat> and it, it, it appeals to people who want to be, oh, I'm in the new, I'm in the know. I have, mm-hmm. I have special information and it links everything up and it brings order to the chaos. Right. And it's, it's, mm-hmm. Well, and it's I get sadly, it's worked. It, it's it, worked for like it works. Uh, for preachers for a long time, right? It's worked. I mean, if sure. you think about it, what's the difference except in kind of it's not the devil, it's the Illuminati, it's not uh, demons, it's hmm. fucking hmm. baby eating, uh, you know, monster politicians and celebrities or something. It's but it's people outside sure. your realm. And by the way, if you take the right picture of them, they look like they have lizard eyes, shit like that. And it's you know, if you, you take advantage of just like frame rate versus filming you'll always catch somebody you know because the linear lines of a television go against the round shape of anything on screen so everybody will get snake eyes at some point if you just wait long enough and and so they just snatch those and they go like see i told you they're all demons um um that there's a certain point where i i do believe that there are like money making uh monsters like Alex Jones. And then there's just a, a a waiting herd of dipshits that are sitting there like fucking baby birds waiting for these dickheads to regurgitate this yeah. bile into their mouths. And 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 if, whether it's the softball lower middle class version of it that uh Glenn Beck does, which is just sell the end times but in end times, you could also have a retirement plan in, you know, the end times where, you know, if, uh, if you need a catheter, we have one for you. But, you know, like um, you might need pancake, giant vats of pancake batter for your underground bunker, but you also might need a new visa. So that's that's the Glenn Beck version. Whereas, like, I guess Alex Jones's thing is you're going to need a bunch of food and dick pills so you can, you know, You'll be fat and and rapey for the for when Jesus comes back. I don't know what the fuck, but for real, there, there's that you know that arc of it. But all of them, I would say, are conspiracists, not conspiracy theorists. Any person who actually believes a conspiracy might exist has a theory about how it might happen. Rico, in many ways, is a theory until you prove it. Right? You can have the, uh, like you could go. The RICO charges against Trump in Georgia or elsewhere, or even his his uh, coordination between uh, like Walt Nada and De Oliveira and those guys, until you know that they're conspiring to move these boxes around and flood the fucking server room and all that kind of shit. It's it's a conspiracy theory. It's a theory about what they're conspiring to do. Now they were absolutely conspiring to do this, and there is evidence to prove it. So they were charged with conspiracy. But up until that point, you're looking at the evidence, you have a theory. But you're not taking like, he likes this guy and this song was on the radio at this point and there were chemtrails on the sky on that day and it's the, <clears throat> it's, it's uh, David Koresh's, the, the, you know, the anniversary of his bris and you, t- you throw all that shit together and go, see, this is how it all works. That would be a conspiracist. Mm-hmm. That would be them engaging in conspiracism. And I think and, it's and given... It's, and it's based on fear. Based yes. on fear. Always based on fear. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. You never hear you never hear a conspiracy about, uh, uh, you know, they're trying to make more puppies and bunnies in this world. Right. It's, it's you know, it's, it's always based on there's this mm-hmm. crimson thing behind the curtain that's going to come and kill you and right. destroy you. It's never... You know, it's because it's 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 about getting that little tingle, and it's about right. feeling special that you're in the know about stuff that nobody else yeah. does. It's 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 human nature. It is yeah. what we do. But you know what pisses them off more than anything else, Hal? Yeah, guys who are either into conspiracy theories or yeah. are conspiracists or yeah. whatever it is, or 
on our side of the aisle when it comes to the left and you know, folks like TYT or what have you. Yep. It it what pisses them off more than anything else is is people who go, you know, we're gonna be okay. It's you know, things yep. things are things are tough. You We've know, been things through worse. will be tough, bad things will happen. And you are, yep. But you and know what? At the end of the day, we're we're gonna be we, 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 you know, we'll be okay. And yep. and we'll have puppies and bunnies and flowers. But we'll, we'll also have to fight the good fight and and right. and you know stand. It's going to take for work. our convictions and our beliefs. That's and it's right. going to be hard work. Yeah. Um, but uh, what's the point in despair? What's the point in you know just fear for fear's sake? You know, oh, you know. Well, because if anybody goes outside, all the time. It's it's. The, yep. I'll tell you what it is. It's it, it it's the abusive partner syndrome. If you're able to go out and make friends. And if I if I go, you know, you think I treat you like shit, wait till other people start hitting you or wait till other people start mocking you or, or, or belittling you or any of that shit. You better not go outside. Well, the fear is if you go outside, you'll find out that's bullshit. And most people aren't like that. And if you're not trapped in that environment, that abusive partner can't control you and they can't limit you know, the resources, be it sexual gratification or you cleaning up their room or whatever the fuck they, they use to manipulate you into being a housemate for, um, that's what an abuser does. And I would argue that that is the TYT model, that they are, yeah. to, to our side of the aisle, they are the abusive part. If you stray outside this, you're going to find out that it's even worse and that you're going to be part of the monster. You'll become like them and, and that kind of thing. And it's like, no, nah, I don't, think so. I mean, I, I know there are bad people in the world, but I don't think the majority of people are like that. And I think if you give people a chance and try to work through shit, you might find that you agree on more than you disagree on. And that's a starting point for friendships and understanding. And and even even in the case of a charmer like myself, uh, the, the groundwork for convincing the other person that your way is better, superior, might even help them more. Right, convince them of of your way as opposed to beating it into them or making them afraid. If they try anything else, they're gonna die or kill somebody or be a monster or whatever that shit is. It's a, that's an abusive partner. That's what an abusive partner does. Um, and you did not, uh, Kelly. He's coming on. He'll be fifteen minutes late according to them. So we're we're waiting in the wings. It's very exciting. It's, we'll build up tension. And I even I even made a little graphic for him. So I was very excited. Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm uh, look. I made you know. I, I got Phil. I made you a, a graphic with the with the Ukrainian flag you in sure it. Sure did. That's yep. there. And um, you know, and I made a and one for Johnny and everybody as well. So I I've been doing my work behind the scenes all by my lonesome. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, so I, I I'm not uh, you know we're moving into a new chapter where we can start you know helping people promote things because I'm getting to that number. But you have to you have to subscribe. You got to hit the like and the subscribe and support the show on patreoncom slash sparks and. Venmo, etc. Um, that that said, <clears throat> one of the things that you know, uh, I I don't know if you know this, but um, we talked about it sort of at the beginning. But Mos- Moscow is trying to blame us and Ukraine for the uh, the attack on on um, Crocus Hall. Well, uh, ISIS just released it re- released first person video from the killers of the assault on Crocus Hall that only they have. And uh, this is, uh, everybody's saying, this is one of the first times they've ever seen ISIS have to prove they were behind an attack. It used to be enough, they just claim that it was them and that was that. Uh, Well, uh, they have an angle that only they could have. And... I have unfortunately seen some of it, and it is as horrifying and brutal and sad and destructive as you can possibly imagine. Um, and so the idea that somehow, you know, they need that Russia needed any help, you know, or I, uh, you know, ISA needed any help hating Russia or acting out uh, in this way is ridiculous. Um, at its face, but now they have released footage from their killers of the killings. And, uh, which I, I guess, you know, in, in any sane world would put to bed all this bullshit. 
Um, but, uh, you know, we'll see. Well, he's going to continue. Uh, Putin will continue, and along with uh, his his uh, you know supporters and the, the the powerful elite, to um, to pin this on the Ukrainians. Yeah. Um, no, no matter what ISIS says. I mean, I, I saw another thing uh, in the last thirty six forty eight hours um, that apparently <laughs> mm-hmm. Alexander Lukashenko came out and said, actually, they tried to get through the Belarusian border, but we turned them away. Yeah. Um, right. we, 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 we were suspect of them, and so sure. we did not let them enter Belarus, and we turned them away. To which I'm sure Vladimir Putin and, uh, you know, Petrushev and all the powerful, you know, uh, Solovyev and Semyon were going like, shut up! Shut up, right, yeah. What are you doing? No! Right. No, no, no. They were trying to get into Ukraine because yeah. Ukraine was opening up a back door right. corridor so that they could escape. Shut up, yeah. Alexander. Right, we're trying you to know? create this narrative and you're fucking up the whole thing. Narrative. Never, never mind the fact. <laughs> never mind the fact that the area of Ukraine that they would be fleeing into is currently controlled yeah. by Russia and is specifically yeah. the Chechen controlled area. And Chechens have a, 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 a long and storied history of terrorist attacks inside mother Russia. Um, and so mm-hmm. even that part is bullshit, but they were trying, they, you know, you got to give them an F for trying. And, um, so it, yeah, it's just, it, it they have no narrative. So any other details to the contrary, flatten the whole fucking thing. But again, it it is immaterial in terms of you know real people who believe in real evidence because like i said that footage is out and uh yeah, there's, isis there's, is uh, is proud of are, it there, yeah and there are so many reasons for um for islamic jihadists to uh have beef mm-hmm. with moscow i mean mm-hmm. going back centuries literally you know uh Mm-hmm. Despite the population in Russia of um, the faithful, and there are many Muslim Russians who are, I'm sure, you know, uh, who, who are a- completely apolitical, totally. But they also there is a there is a, a um, the, the racism is rampant mm-hmm. in, in Russia, and right. white Christian nationalism is rampant in Russia. Um, which is to, uh, to is, which Mar- is, Marjorie Taylor Greene would say, what's not to like? What's not to like? The, the, it's the, um, it is not that necessarily they are, uh, they're not mm-hmm. treated well. Let's, I'm mm-hmm. not going to say that, but, in, but it's not that they are, um, uh, you know, Muslims in Russia can be, you know, just your neighbor. Right. But there's such re- ethnic uh, animosity, uh, tension, mm-hmm. animosity, racism, uh, that people who live, if you are not a Russian, ethnic Russian, um, Orthodox Christian, and a Putin supporter in today's Russia, Mm-hmm. Um, you are, you, you get the short end of the stick. And I remember when I lived in Moscow, that there was a, a market near the theater. I think I've told you this story before. There's a, there was a movie theater in the Radisson hotel. I want to say it was the Radisson, right. um, that showed movies in, in with subtitles with Russian subtitles, but the audio was still in English. Right. So we would go and see these movies because you, you could get a little relief from always having to speak Russian, but right behind it was a, a market run by Tajiks. Mm-hmm. And every month, almost like clockwork, the Moscow city security authorities would just go through the market and crack heads. Just to reiterate, you are guests in this country. You are not welcome here. We see you as a criminal element. We see you as, uh, you know, as, as, as a, as a kind of, you know, as a uh, undesirable element within our city, and we will constantly be putting you down. We will right. be knocking you down on your knees constantly. 
And that's how Tajiks and Uzbeks and uh, to a certain extent, people from the Caucasus, Georgians, Armenians, right. Azerbaijanis, Turkmen, uh, these ethnic groups, uh, because if you are not, if you're, it's, you know, separate but equal is not equal. Right. <laughs> and, and identity is very much in, in Putin's Russia in particular, but I would argue it, it's not just Putin's Russia that Russia has a long history of this is that if you're, if you're not, if you're not Russian Christian, mm -hmm. you know, all the rest of it, you're not in the power structure, which is always Russia and Russian ethnically um, that you're going to get, you're going to get knocked around. And so look, they're, they're treated terribly Tajiks in the former Soviet union and, and within Russia, within the Russian Federation. I'm not shocked at all that these guys, you know, would would well, well yeah rear, the, uh, that they obviously their ugly head would rear again. Right. Obviously, the the conspiracy theories about this, and I would say this is different than the conspiracist or conspiracism concept that I'm trying to float and make sure that people know the difference. Um, and thank you for gifting the subs. That was really lovely. Uh, who just did that? Uh, Mende. Thank you so much. Um, uh, don't forget to hit that like, guys. Let them know we're here because that lets people know that the that the stream is live. Um, and that you like it. <laughs> um, the, uh, the, you know, one of the theories about sort of the attack itself is that the FSB paid these guys to get, carry it out because they would have done it anyways. And if you've got terrorists inside your own country, you can just give them the push they need and then wait till they do it. And then, you know, it's, it's many of the theories behind, uh, you know, the, the conspiracy theories around uh, the conspiracism around 9-11 and the, um, you know, and the Cheney, you know, organizing it essentially to do this so that they could do the Patriot Act and all this other shit. And that they wanted to do this, the PNAC seven country role, the dominoes in the, you know, in the Middle East that they wanted to do. Um, and uh, let's see, uh, Leslie, I, 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 I'm scrolling back to, hopefully I can see it. I will try. Uh, you have a, I will try to find it. Um uh, just retype it and pop it in there, just the words. You don't have to uh, re-super chat it so I can see it. Um, but yeah, um, conspiracy hypothesis is too unwieldy. I agree. But the idea is that the FSB organized this, paid these guys. They didn't know where the money was coming from. They thought they were getting it from a legit source, but they carried it out because they're that's the kind of monster they are. If you know you have monsters socked away, it's just about flicking them the first domino and it will start to move. And, and that's what they did with these guys. And that's why it was like, I guess the the police station or the the security services was like right across the street, but it took them an hour to get there and do anything about it. And the whole attack took like seven minutes. I mean, the rest of it was like the fire and everything. There were people storming out of there and, you know, within two minutes running from the gunfire. So, uh, it, again, this is supposed to be a highly secure... Um, state you know that where he's a powerful leader and and blah blah, blah. Mm -hmm. well then how the fuck did this happen well you either want it to or you're full of shit these are your options you're either incompetent or corrupt these are your two options yeah um so and this is the prom the promise that putin made to his people was i will i will keep the bad days of the 90s where there were drive-by shootings and uh, car bombings and, uh, you, you know, you take your pick in Moscow, uh, not to mention other cities around Russia, that I will, the, the promise that Putin made was, I will bring you stability. Yeah. Don't worry about, you know, the, your infringements on your civil liberties. We're going to take away a free press. We're going to, you know, we're going to have sham elections. Right. But what we, what I promise to bring you is there won't be any more car bombings or shootings. Well, here we go, you know? Mm -hmm. And so it, it, it's the, the, the soft underbelly of uh, Russia has always been described as the Caucasus in Central Asia, where, right. where you know, the, there's mm -hmm. cultures and, and uh, languages and uh, empires have kind of clashed and there's there have been... That so while they're distracted with Ukraine, they have taken their eyes off the prize when it comes to those groups mm -hmm. who have right. legit beef against Moscow as well. 
now they're starting to take advantage of the fact that Russia is completely preoccupied with Ukraine. And I don't, I don't know, mm -hmm. but I wouldn't be terribly surprised if we don't see a full-fledged terror campaign that mm -hmm. starts up in, in Russia where, you know, there are, you know, metro bombings and, uh, you know, not just in Moscow, but in places like Ekaterinburg or Petersburg right. or Sochi, um, it won't make it, you know, it, it might even go, it might even go to the farther provinces mm -hmm. like, you know, uh, uh, Novosibirsk or, you know, smaller places, Volgograd. Right. Um, uh, that will just continue with, that will, that will um, continue to perpetrate the idea that no, no place safe is in Russia and the promises that Putin made uh, to you and has kept him in power for as long as he has uh, don't, aren't worth a dime and um you know that will undermine uh his support and people will be like why are we fighting in ukraine when we got these crazy islamic terrorists running around and we right we we're, we're spread too thin we need look it's i don't mm -hmm. think that ukraine and the these elements in the caucuses or central asia are in any way collaborating um, because it's Ukraine wants very different things, and it's it's oil and uh, oil and water. They're just they're not going to work well together. Right. These groups, um, and it also if if Ukraine gets caught uh, with you know dallying with these guys, then then we're going to get a major shellacking, and it's going to be counterproductive to, to their interests and their and their their, their perception in public global public opinion so i don't see collaboration happening i see i see these yeah. insurgents and terrorists yeah. potentially uh taking advantage of the situation and making hay while the, the sun shines while uh, moscow Agreed. and the kremlin are preoccupied with, with ukraine um i so, want to thank uh, i see yeah. levin levin's yeah, here there yeah. he is so i'm gonna i will i will hop off uh mr Parnas, lev um privet uh is uh Kiev. Mm -hmm. uh i just uh before i disappear if you can hear me um thank you very yeah. much for everything that you have done thank you for your recent uh, address on the hill uh yeah. those of us who have been paying attention to the threat from the kremlin and, and from moscow when it comes to uh eroding our democracy and a very real tangible military threat uh in a psychological warfare arena mm -hmm. as well as tangibly physically uh a, a threat to the west and you're bringing the spotlight and 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 trying to make folks aware of what's really happening when it comes to putin's malign interests and his his attacks on the west uh are appreciated by those of us who pay close attention to this place uh and uh and so uh, before i jump off i just if if i uh, you know given the opportunity i thank you very much and i hope you know yeah i know you'll I'll, have a great conversation so i'll you. be thank listening you. Thank you yeah. so much. Slava Ukraine. Yeah. Slava yeah. Ukraine. Yeah. Ukraine. Yeah. Yeah. Slava. I mean, I yeah. literally did. That's right. why I was late. I'm sorry I was late. How is because I was doing a live television in Ukraine. No, I get it. Yeah. I was doing an interview there because I think it's important for their people to understand what's going on here and what's going on uh, because I think in our politics uh, as well. Yeah. yeah I mean, their, their lives depend on it. I mean, as crazy as it is. Yeah. Mm hmm. Well, I I'm in I'm in Kiev, Lev. So yeah. it, it, it's even those even those foreigners who are over here, uh, we're under threat directly as well. But I know that the threat is is bigger and larger, and so I, I appreciate everything that you've been doing. And, and there, I'll jump off anything, now. So if there's anything you if there's anything you need, let me know. And yeah. the, the she'll does the great work. I'll, I'll the link the you opportunity guys up. Need to have an interview with you sometime, Lev. I I really would. I've, I'm launching a podcast here in Kiev to give voice to prominent Ukrainian and, and people who have interest in Ukraine uh, and also this conflict between Putin and the West. Um, and, and so I hope that uh, somewhere in the, say, a week Absolutely. or two or maybe even three, we'll get an opportunity to talk. But again, Slava Ukraine, Karoim Slava, Sebud Ukraine. Thanks. Thanks, Phil. See you again. And uh, Lev, thanks for coming on the show today. I really greatly appreciate it. I had the pleasure thanks of having your... Me, yeah, your son on recently, and uh, he's a gentleman, and he's bright, and he's a, uh, clearly a good human being. So uh, I think you have you played no small small part in that, and it's uh, I think it speaks well of you as a human being. 
Um, Thank you. Yeah, I'm I very know. Proud of him. Very yeah, absolutely. Proud of him. Um, I uh, and it's interesting. I I almost feel like I owe you an apology right out of the gate because I I made a, a, a back when you were under the the Trump veil when you were a member of the you know the first order. Um, I. The, the, the fact that your company at the time was called Fraud Guarantee was, I have to say, so on the nose. And as a comedian, I would have I would have been derelict in my duty had I not just gone <laughs> to it every time <laughs> it came up. That said, yeah. No, yeah. No. <laughs> that, you weren't I, the only one. I mean, they, everybody had a I mean. Yes, it was going up. By the way, uh, Lev has a new book out, by the way. You like my new graphic? I just made that. Um, oh, I love it. <laughs> that's his new book, uh, Shadow Diplomacy. I uh, I just bought it on Kindle after I saw another interview that you did, and that's when we wanted to talk to you. Um, it's it's fascinating. It's a uh, um, it it's it, there's so much to get in with you, and I know <laughs> a, a lot of people are really appreciated the fact that like how you spoke when you were on the you know, in front of the committee with Bob Alinsky and him being just a douchebag and going, are you threatening me? And you're like, hey, come on, dude, just calling. I went to jail for lying. You you're lying. Right. Um, had you ever met him before that day? No. Yeah. No, no, um, I've never, I've never, yeah. but I, yeah, but he's so connected. Um, anyways, <laughs> I find that very funny. <laughs> Right. I mean, he, he I mean, he uh, definitely, you know, I'm finding out more and more lately that he is pretty well connected, but connected to some very strange fellas. Yes. <laughs> so I think I think there's a lot more to that story than is yet to be told. Right. Well, let's talk about some strange fellows now that I have you here, because I I am of the big belief that there is no Hunter Biden laptop. I've talked about this for a long time. I will stand by that to the end of the days because I think it was part of a scam that was put together. And the hard drive itself was more than likely put by, together by Russians in Ukraine, given to Rudy or somebody associated with him, eventually made its way to the States and that whole shenanigans. What was it like? I mean, I know you were you viewed it as like a cult and less like a mafia in terms of your relationship with Trump. Um what was your conduit to him was largely Rudy Giuliani. Um, no, no. So uh, l let me tell you. Uh, so I knew Trump okay. before I knew Giuliani. Yeah, I had a I had a much closer relationship because from a donor and friendship and supporter. Uh, right. And then uh, till about summertime uh, of 2018, when I was introduced to Giuliani on a business level to get involved mm -hmm. in fraud guarantee, mm -hmm. even though I've known Giuliani from social meeting because of my relationship with Trump, I, mm -hmm. I've seen Giuliani. Gotcha. Uh, once me and Giuliani got close, uh, then then he became the intermediary between me and Trump because mm -hmm. at, at, at when I started working for Trump and going to Ukraine, they didn't want me to go to the White House. They didn't want me to go to any events. They didn't want to be any link just in case uh, the media would get a hold of it and it would be right yeah that's what i that, that's what i meant is like in your in the interviews that i've seen and other stuff that i've read you you know giuliani would be on the phone with trump or be conveying stuff to you for this stuff for these missions and the like that you would go over there yeah. um but rudy was had a like a security firm that he was <laughs> involved yeah. in which seems I mean, weird um but was that part of it as well? Did he use that as sort of his like cover and his clout post nine eleven in uh, in Europe and Ukraine and? Well, yeah. Listen, because after nine yeah. eleven, you know, he had the name. Uh, he partnered up with some uh, actual security experts uh, that used to, I think, work for him in New York when the, on the special police force or on special uh, one of those forces, and yeah. he partnered up with one of them. And uh, he he just used the name. That's all, Rudy. Rudy would That's just right. go name, do the spiel, and then you know there would actually sure. be people trying to go get those work done. But that all changed in, uh, when Rudy went to Ukraine and Rudy started dealing with Ukraine because at that point, Rudy stopped giving, caring about any of the business and started only caring about the investigation into finding dirt on the Bidens, finding the black uh, ledger, false black ledger on Manafort, finding the DNC servers. I mean, and the list goes on. Right. So when, once he got obsessed with that and taken over, uh, all his businesses started failing because, uh, you know, he wouldn't, he wouldn't make appearances. He wouldn't have the time to deal with it and so on and so on and trump wasn't paying him it was really weird again this speaks more to the I think, cult. I, yeah 
Well, okay. you know, I, I mean, I, I don't think, I think Rudy, uh, I don't know their actual conversations, but right. I've heard Rudy make slip of the tongues like that once this is over, uh, you know, I'm going to, Trump's going right. to take care of me and pay. So I think Rudy was expecting to get paid once, but, you know, in maybe different ways, maybe through different contracts, maybe, I, I don't know. Cabinet but position, Rudy, yeah, that kind of stuff. He, too. I, he, he no he i think he expected to get paid somehow after okay. his work I don't, I don't think he was working for free i mean because yeah. uh just watching his ammo the way he did things i mean with everybody he, he would put buffers in to get paid and then get paid from them on the back end like you know kind of way so it was okay. never straight deals well you have to understand he was going through a divorce so he had to hide he everything was, uh, yeah, right he had I mean, he didn't have to, but he chose to. <laughs> right, that's true. That's excellent point. Well, he also, he hit, well, I mean, apparently he had to hide his wife's laptop, which he stole know, from he her. Did, he tried to. Yeah, yeah right. He tried it was, to. it was, uh, it, when they raided his place, so they served a search warrant on his place and they got all his communication devices. He was trying to pawn off those hard drive copies that he had, right, on, uh, you know, on them, whatever, just to try and see this story going forward. But what ultimately they did is they found that he had stolen his wife's laptop and was using information on it in his divorce against her, whatever. It's just creepy. Um, so uh, my question is, like, you you got to know Trump and you were in kind of the social circle in Florida mainly or, or yeah. in New York? No, Florida primarily. Yeah. And um, uh, this is kind of a weird question, but did you ever see, uh, like, Epstein around him at that time? Did you – Did it, was he ever at any of those things over the years? Because it might have been after. You probably mm – -hmm came along after it was yeah it was probably after but i wasn't that close with him in the social sure. circles like right. you know i, I want to be clear i mean i could have met you know i could have met him three four times at different events with ivanka taking pictures and stuff like that right uh, when we really got close was when i held that uh after actually my first uh event with aaron when when i took aaron to his first uh um like rally fundraiser at the, oh, rally, okay, right. at yeah. the, the rally at the rally that was that was like our first inter and from there it grew into me hosting a dinner for him and then here we are gotcha now i think a lot of us remember and i want to like get into like a couple of other people like dimitri Fertash and and that crowd a little bit and sort of rudy giuliani's relationship with them as well as yours but um i think one of the biggest things that stood out not only that you know, your testimony, you know, was it last week, week before that, um, you know, it was very direct. And I feel I felt you were kind of uh, misused, as it were, in that situation, because it was really just a show for Bobolinsky to BS his way through that thing. That's what it was. But we appreciate you being there and speaking back to it. I think one of the most thing, one of the things that really stood out for me when you you obviously wanted to come clean about this, the stuff you were involved in and you had that recording of that dinner where, you know, they were, they were going to fire, uh, you know, Marie Ivanovich. Yeah. And I, 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 as at that point, it's curious to me why people record other people they're in business with or in a circumstance with, whether it's for clout or whether it's for blackmail or whether it's for safety or whatever. That it, what's going through your head when you, uh, A, you, I, you can tell you're carrying your phone and so you're not holding it up like somebody who's like, look where I am. You're definitely palming that thing down and then it's laying it on the table or whatever it wasn't yeah. me it wasn't, oh, wasn't me. you well, okay. what happened, no what okay. happened was uh i my partner igor who was with me gotcha. he did the recordings and there's that's not the only recordings i have several other recordings that he did and meetings with trump and uh that and hmm. giuliani and ronna mcdaniel and others that uh he's that he sent me that i have and uh, and so do the uh, Southern District, and so do Bill Barr, and so right. do the congressmen sitting up right, there. That's why they, they didn't ask me any questions, of course. Right. So yeah, so I didn't take the recording, but I found the recording on my uh, on uh, Igor sent me. The reason why Igor took the recording uh, was not to be to 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 do anything uh, illegal, but it was more for ver validation. Sure. Because when we when we when Igor was trying to do business, me and him in Ukraine. And over there, you know, when you show a picture with somebody, it's one thing and it goes a long way. But if you could show a video or right. an actual conversation, it puts you in a different realm. 
So when Igor got the opportunity to be in that dinner with Trump, uh, and you know, the crazy part is nobody took our phones, nobody. So, uh, you know, anybody could have been recording. Right. You, you would think that when you're with the president of the US, there's some protocol that has to go or some announcement, at least no, nobody ever said anything even. So, uh, wow. <laughs> it was great. So yeah, so, uh, that, that's why he was doing this stuff because he was doing it to validate uh different meetings he would have sure. there for for our business purposes gotcha uh, yeah okay so um I, I think also you talked about um again the difference between like trump being a you know his world being a cultish more than um you know a mob boss um even though that's clearly what he wants to be in some cases or tries to act like and you know and i think that's the root of his perfect phone call bullshit that whole like well yeah I, it yeah. was a perfect phone call so the idea would be is that I'm going to say the 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 safe, l legally non-binding version of it, and then Rudy, or in some cases you, will go over there and tell them the truth. And at one point, you were the purveyor of the, as it were, the bad news, the tougher version of that conversation, right? right? Well, t well, Trump is a phenomenon. He's a combination. You have to understand. Yes, he's a mob boss. He's yeah. he. That's how he lived his whole life. Looked up to mobsters, and you know, started running in 2016. Started running his uh, uh, White House as a mob boss. But then he realized at some point that he became a cult leader mm -hmm. because as a mob boss, you have to, you know, uh, there has to be money constantly. involved. people have, right. have loyalty for money, they don't have loyalty for a mission. These guys are there to make money and when you're in the mob. You're not there because you like the guy. You know right. Say to you? It's all mercenary. So, so he had that, right. Right. So he is. So he had that transformation when he started realizing that people start following him for what he was saying. So he turned into a cult leader with the mob mentality, which is even more dangerous. Oof, uh, yeah. I don't know. He's uh, phenomenal when it comes to that. But no, it's definitely a cult. Yeah. Uh, he, you know, and the way a cult runs is by basically putting blinders on everybody there and feeding him only one source of information until your mind, which is the most powerful thing we have, eventually blocks everything else out, doesn't allow you to think. And that's why you mm -hmm. look at some of the powerful common, common sense of the doctors, lawyers, politicians that yeah. 10 years ago, eight years ago, before Trump would, you would never would say something like that. But now all of a sudden you, they're saying such wacky, crazy things. And you're like, what, what is that? But when you're in an echo chamber for long enough, eventually your mind is so strong, just like your mind learns a lot, you mm -hmm. can do the same thing. It's shut out a lot. Right. And then when you're and then it becomes so strong where you only believe one thing and you can't prove nobody wrong. And that's the cult mentality, and that's what Trump does. Yeah. Well, the you know, it taking control of somebody's reticular activating system, which is effectively your your ability to like separate things out like it's right. the idea of you you're thinking about buying a specific car and suddenly that's the only car you exactly. see on the freeway. It's a version of that. That's what that's right. how the cult thing works. That's, ex that's exactly that's exactly what it is. Exactly. We're, if I show you only a blue car nonstop, eventually you're going to walk in and you're going to want a blue car. Yeah, right. <laughs> and in your case, it's almost like you started, you know, when you were involved with him more from a business standpoint, because you looked at him as a successful businessman and you kind of, you know, minor bought the kind of Forbes Kool-Aid, it seems a little bit, but the, nothing extreme. But then you became a like a real supporter of his and be, it became more like a cult experience for you. Oh, absolutely. Say, I had the same transition. I mean, originally it was all business. I, I didn't look up to him. I didn't, you know, it wasn't like somebody I trusted or would do anything for, but I thought it would be a great opportunity and somebody that I could make money with and obviously yeah. be, you know, with the maybe next president or at least president elect. Sure. A very powerful title. Uh, and then, and then once uh, I start, it, it, the cult, cultish environment started turning after the dinner. After we yeah. had that dinner when, uh, w that we held for him, I started traveling it with him every day uh, to every rally, to the mm -hmm. uh, uh, Hillary Clinton debates, to uh, to basically when he won. And when you're and it was a small group of people that we were together all the time, mm -hmm. and we would block out. We started yeah. blocking out all the media. We started blocking out all the negativity. We just started talking about our own positive, talking the same thing. And in a period of three, four months, you felt you like. You felt like you were repeat. You were saying the same thing, and it was a group. And when he won, it was it just started steamrolling from there. right reinforces so, it. So, yeah, right. So I was pretty much in the cult uh, after the election. You know, I was sure. in, but at, but I when I became really deep in is once he tasked me with the mission because I took that as something so big and so uh, like a sacred soldier. So, 
right like so important like i'm gonna save our country i have an opportunity to make history to do something you know that leave a history behind for my kids and grandkids that it at that point between me being already in the cold already being with the blinders on with the information now i added that the power of being next to the most powerful man in the world and listening yeah. to him and him being the leader of that cult it was over with and i and i and i'm honest i mean i'll be i was probably number one you know in, in that cult I was yeah the, look at michael I, cohen I, he had the same experience like look at yeah. it you know just if you watch his his tv appearances where he's defending trump with his whole like says who thing that he did about yeah. you know whether uh he was lying and that kind of stuff whether trump was lying it's clear he's not just selling it he's in right and do you think it's um like mercenaries mercenaries can keep mercenaring until the check doesn't clear so you can keep buying their loyalty for ever but if you think because you kind of were in the cult side of it and it was based on it seems like you have a pretty good idea of what's right and wrong hence starting a company like fraud guarantee after you've been defrauded you started that to fight back against that that's still there that egg of like ethics is there weaponized by trump maybe but do you think waking up to it kind of reignited that like oh my god this is all he's a total fraud and this is exactly the kind of thing i you know it's happening over again or, or are you just like well well you gotta understand how when you're in it yeah that's what's very hard for people so when you're in that cult environment because you you first lack the information and then you choose to block out the information you you don't know that mm -hmm. you're a part of a fraud you don't realize that you you truly believe that you're on the right side you truly believe that you're it's like such a yeah. crazy mental experience sure. it's like the it's like the loonies leading the asylum basically <laughs> where you right. feel like you're, you're in charge and you know mm -hmm. and that's how it is and uh but when i had the chance to come out and actually reflect and had the time to really understand then it was you know i started getting looking at other information started get opening up my mind and started thinking and then when you started thinking yes your mind becomes rational you start getting back and realize oh, i'm sorry that's my daughter in the back don't ever apologize for kids making noise in the background i have a 12 year old and it's a joyful sound just the fact that it's happening. Don't ever worry about that. And also, I heard your dogs in the background, which means you're a dog lover, so we like you even yes, more. So, I, got a dog. I, have a, I have a dog, a cat, you're not. seven kids. Yeah, have it's, it's not a big deal. So uh, also, I want to remind everybody before I get to my next question, uh, Lev has a book called Shadow Diplomacy. It's out now. I bought it on Kindle because I'm diving into it, and it sent me down a rabbit hole almost immediately. Because I, I don't know if you've ever seen my show before, probably not, but I... I do this thing where, you know, when I do live videos of Trump and whoever else talking about their stuff, and sometimes they'll bring up a detail and I'll go, hang on a second, that sounds funky. And we'll live go down through sort of old articles and st whether it's statistics or something like that, that because it sounds hinky, right? And so we'll break it down. And that's what your book did to me. It's like I was maybe three pages in and I was like, wait a fucking second. Felix Sater and Bayrock, hang on. You know, I was like, I, <laughs> right? And um, and and then, of course, uh, Dimitri Firtash, who I think in 2022 is finally like, I think he's hiding in Belarus, I guess, right now or something, but they're trying to extra, yeah. no? Nope. He's, still, he's he, still in Vienna. Oh, he's in Vienna? Okay, yeah. Is that how you stay in Switzerland's just kind of, like, that's where you go? All right, in case I ever have Vienna's to bug out like Diddy, Vienna, that's Vienna's where I should go. Switzerland. Yeah, okay. Did he, did he, Vienna's in the Switzerland, did he? right? <laughs> so, um, you know, the you grew up, you knew Felix Sater from the neighborhood when you were young, not uh, like closely, but you knew of him and stuff. He was well, a I mouth, know, right? I know him I know oh, do you? Okay. Closely. Yeah, yeah. I write about in the book. I'm, you know, I used to even work with his father. His father was my partner in Ukraine and Russia, not Ukraine, Russia. Yeah. Back in the Soviet Union, when we were doing import export. And right. then I dealt, worked with Felix a little bit in uh, Wall Street when I was still a young pup. He was a, a few years older than me back then, and he was already in, in his Wall Street years. And yeah. Uh, so, yeah, I've known Felix for many years. Right. So, and Felix had that company, Bayrock. And Bayrock yeah. was, uh, you know, partnered with Trump on um, a couple of things, certainly, and and even had a business card for Trump. Trump the Trump, Trump, yeah. Trump Soho, but Trump was, Soho was the big one, right. Yeah. And diving into that, I was like, that in and of itself is a is a 
Gordian knot spider web of mobbed up Russian money and all kinds of crazy. Just that the the essence of it as basically he it's exactly the Mar-a-Lago thing where he can't live in it from 90 day you know more than 90 days because it's not technically a residence so he's got to stay out you can rent it but it's not a hotel because it can have condos that's what Soho was Soho was he was just getting around zoning laws do you know anything about that deal as it came up and all that kind of stuff because it you know because of Felix Vera yeah I mean no Felix was definitely involved in the deal there was money coming from Kazakhstan at the time and you know uh, I don't know too much enough about that the situation that I would be comfortable because I like right. to talk facts and not opinions. Sure, uh, sure, sure. I give them an opportunity to discredit my real facts. But yeah, yeah. So, but, but I'll tell you the whole thing about Trump and working with Felix. It was it, it shouldn't surprise anybody because you have to understand, Trump uh, in the '90s uh, all of a sudden started selling Trump uh, when when the, when the fall of Russia happened. A lot of Russians started coming. A lot of Russian money started pouring into the United mm-hmm. States and Russia started coming, if you remember. So oh, yeah. a lot of it started coming into it because when they came to New York, Trump was like the name, the brand, and they started going to Trump Towers. But the difference is when a regular person bought an apartment or uh, maybe two apartments, when the Russians came, they would buy up 20 apartments at a clip, a floor at a clip. Right. So that uh, and when you're a developer, especially Trump, you notice that right away. And that's why Trump started having a very close relationship with Russians that came from this former Soviet Union with lots of money that started investing into his projects. Felix happened to have that same connection with that same sorts of people that were coming in at the same time. Right. So uh, Trump dealt, you know, Trump, Trump dealing with Felix is no big deal. I mean, Trump dealt with, think yeah. about how many mobsters to, I mean, he dealt with John Gotti and Sammy the Bulgarana. He couldn't yeah. have because otherwise he wouldn't have built one building in, in New York in the 80s. Right, right. And, yeah, know. yeah. So, you know, I mean, his casino in New Jersey. I mean, just think about the characters he dealt with there. So, yeah, I mean, it's, it, it's a it's brutal like, Group and and the Russians famously, I think they they were running like a a gambling racket out of yeah, Trump I mean, Tower. Yeah, they bought a absolutely. whole floor and yeah. and um and the Soho thing. What was I I think kind of fascinating to me was that in he got sued by the people who were buying condos in it, even though there were like timeshares. You couldn't stay in them more than twenty nine days in a row, and they were rented as hotel rooms. And you're not there. The whole thing was very right. odd, but right. the and and it was. Uh, the, I guess the biggest weird thing about it, and this is the very kind of s- scary Russian aspect of it, was he was claiming, much like his latest fraud, that it was sixty percent. It was sixty percent sold. Well, it wasn't. <laughs> it wasn't anywhere near it. It was fifteen percent or sixteen percent sold. That. Yeah, and yeah, that. and banks wouldn't loan if you wanted to buy one of those condos in that building. Banks wouldn't loan to you because they won't loan to you unless they're at you know that fifty percent presale. Because they think the building's going to be sold or, or fall apart if or whatever. I, if, I remember, if I remember correctly, Ivanka and uh, Don Jr. were on the paper. They were on the paperwork on that deal. If I that's right. Correctly. Yeah, and they, they, they both were. And since then, he seems to have moved Ivanka away from stuff and served Eric up as the as, <laughs> as the, the sacrificial lamb. Yes, <laughs> he's a sacrificial lamb, Eric. <laughs> it's so weird, it's, right? Because he, really you know, he pled the fifth over 500 times in his testimony about the fraud case don and ivanka didn't because they were kept in the dark i guess is the is the theory the the question for me was and i think a lot of people are asking like how did you get out what was the breaking point for you what was the moment where you were like the the aha moment or the i gotta do this even if it's painful moment that like where you put trump behind you in that regard I don't think it was one moment uh, mm-hmm. because uh, I was so deep in the cult uh, uh, that it, w- it took me time to actually really be free. I mean, uh, you know, one of the things I also, you know, I'm a recovering uh, gambler and I uh, had yeah, four years of sobriety from Gamblers Anonymous. Congratulations. So, and I, thank you. And I kind of, it was the same time when I left the Trump cult because it's a, gambling has the same type of a little bit of mentality in that. Sure. And uh, uh, it took me some time, but uh it was a progress of basically really starting to get my common senses and bearings on and realizing that the information that that was coming out or what I was doing or the people I was around. And once, once I came to, I mean, it became easy from there because from there, you know, I've always lived my life, you know, I might've not been the most honest person and I've made mistakes, but I've always tried to do the right thing. 
Mm-hmm. I always thought I'm doing the right thing, and I've always right. wanted to do the right thing. So, and that's what drove me with this whole Trump thing because I truly believed I was doing the right thing. And then when I opened my eyes and saw what I was doing, that drove me even harder now to do the right thing by coming mm-hmm. out, telling the truth, and getting everything in the open to make sure the whole world knows. Yeah, and I think we're you know increasingly familiar with that being a a, a moment for. Uh, a lot of people around Trump. There seems to be more than any other person I've ever seen a bunch of people who, if you spend enough time around him, you're either all in because you're kind of scummy like he is, and you just kind of are, you're good with it, and you just think it'll benefit you, or you're you're like, once I've seen the evidence, I can't unsee it. Yeah, you know, again, you you have uh, two combinations of people with Trump. You have one combination of people that are all in. They're the mega loyalists. There's nothing you're right. going to do. Just forget about it. They're done. And then you have other people in the party that, you know, have their own personal greed for either political purposes or financial purposes mm-hmm. or something that where they really don't care. You know, they live today. These are people that don't care about what happens in the world because it doesn't concern them. These are people that don't care what happens with others, people, you know, if they could have abortion sure. or not, as long as it like, doesn't concern them. And then you have that group of people. And that's the majority of the group that, right, that makes up Trump's followers. Yeah. Um, I, I, you know, a lot of the members of his cabinet, you know, uh, and, and I guess some perfunctory secondaries, like, you know, I guess Jared and Ivanka weren't technically cabinet members, but they were floaters, much like Rudy. Um, you know, some, some, it seems like there were a lot of them that John Kelly, other folks where they were just, you know, they were okay with him at first, or they believed the hype or they were like, you know, I, I, I'm for what he's for. So even if he bugs me, I'm okay with it and stuff. But after they saw a certain level of evidence, they're like, screw this guy never again like the never trumper thing is a i've i've never seen that with another politician like there was no never reagan's there was no never bushes in a lot of ways there might have existed but they weren't named like that but there's no because uh, because you can't you can't unsee what you see it's like literally you know watching that bora version of rudy laying on that bed like once you Uh, see that you can't right and i'm sorry for bringing it up because i know right now thanks but thanks for i'll get some steel wool and scrub my brain now thanks a lot i mean that's kind of what you are but also you have to keep in mind a lot of these guys not yeah not me but mostly like the general kelly's and the masses and everybody in the administration they came in thinking that they could control him they thought right. okay you might you might say some things you might do but actually when it comes down to it you're going to listen because 10 of us are going to tell you this is how it goes and you're not going to go against us mm-hmm. when they realized that not only is uncontrollable but they watch because what, what really got to all of them what I, where i think what and that's why i call the book shadow diplomacy mm-hmm. is because trump was running a shadow information a shadow group yeah. Anything he was doing didn't matter if it was Ukraine, if it didn't matter if it was the Mueller report. He had people that were willing to do things outside the box. A, a outside deep state, the, if that, you will. The right. Deep, uh, right, exactly. To do the, the bidding. And so, and when they realized that when the, the actual people saw this, they were like, are you crazy? Like, what the hell is going right. on? Like, right. this is like crazy. This is, you're running the government, the White House. And, the, you know, after that, you can't go back. I mean, right. Especially if, like guys who were in the military or whatever who were very aware they, right. you know, right. they Good. swore an oath to the Constitution not to a man. Exactly. I don't think he has Good. any grasp of of that. Right. Now, I, um, I, and I know we only got about uh, 10 minutes left in our original time, so I want to make sure, be, be mindful of your time. But I want to know if you've seen what I've seen in terms of his sort of mental acuity over the last little bit and, uh, you know, him during the White House, maybe previous in the campaign and that kind of stuff to now, I'm sure you've watched or seen, you know, the relation to this. And like, it, it, it's it's shocking even to me. And I've seen every single rally he's done since 2020. I watched yeah, all of them. Yeah. Well, if you, yeah, if you definitely look from 2016 to now, it's a different guy. Totally yeah. different guy. You know what I'm saying to you? Even from 2020, he's, you know... Definitely, uh, not only, I mean, we could all see the slippages, like, you know, the gaffes and him going mm-hmm. out there. And, yeah. But the simple fact that he can't remember who I am, 
to this right. day. I mean, he literally still like he 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 just he can't remember me to the fact he can't even tweet about me because he doesn't remember me. Like right, right, good point. Because I, mean, I, mean, I, mean, I know he was pretending weird, he didn't know you. <laughs> I know he was pretending he didn't he hadn't talked to you for a good long while. Maybe, Maybe he's not pretending, you know, right? Now. Maybe he has dementia. Maybe he's, you know, these are first. I mean, like he couldn't remember there was a, a Pelosi between Pelosi and, and yeah, uh, Nikki Haley, Nikki, Nikki right? Haley, you know, I mean, oh, so, we have a uh, long yeah. list of them. Um, on long that we, uh, yeah, but you know, that that's kind of like Reagan and um and Iran Contra to some degree with the idea is that by the time Reagan got around to actually testifying about it. It, people were like, maybe he doesn't recall. Maybe he's, he's, you know, and, and it, it right. very well could be the truth. With but, Trump, though. You know the sad part? Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead I was just going to say, say Reagan, Reagan never yeah. said, uh, I have the best memory. <laughs> right. But see, that's normal. You know what I'm saying to you? And that should mm-hmm. be, we shouldn't be laughing or making fun of an of a elderly man because that's what Trump is. He's an elderly man mm-hmm. that has problems with memory. We, but mm-hmm. the reason we have to tell is because that's what he does. He brings it to the spotlight. He yes. tries to embellish it. And we're dragged into this nasty thing talking about, you know, which is which is common sense to everybody. When you get to a certain age, we're all going to have it. Yeah. We're all going to have gas. We're all mm-hmm. going to have but that's But that's not what we should be using against each other as tools right. to, you know, for, for political reasons. Well, I think in the beginning of it, like as he started to slip, these were like silly slips. And, he, and he's so belligerent about it. That I think a lot of people just, you know, you're more mocking the fact that he can't just admit he screwed up or that he missed a word or that he did like a normal person can. And then that became less indicative, especially lately. It's less about the fact that he slips and his ego won't let him do something versus does he really know he can't make sense or his or the word can't get out of his brain, which is very concerning. Now, the, uh, the know, other. And, yeah. yeah. Go ahead. The other important thing that just to follow, I'm sorry to is yeah. watch he's slipping now with the message also if before he could control and keep it in like certain words that he really meant to say like calling the people vermin yes now he's 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 not uh, as you know politically correct even to his stage where he's now starting to slip and tell his true feelings of how he feels about people right. and how he what, what he wants to do and how he wants to act and so on he's getting yeah. more and more brazen if you watch him yeah, because there's no that that guard is gone uh, effectively yeah. in his brain. That sensor that was barely there in the beginning. And the way I would point it out is that he, when he's talking about immigrants now, he doesn't. He no longer says, "And some of them are good people." He's dropped that oh, no, part no. entirely, and they're all from mental institutions, and they're all murderers yeah. and that kind of thing, right? right. So, um, the you know the of the people that you used to be around, are there others that you can talk to that have? fallen out of the part of it that if you know whether I you don't you don't have to name anybody's names or whatever but is there a circle of people where you're like you can at least have a drink with them and go were we ever so foolish oh it's actually it's interesting I I, I won't mention names but there's a yeah. group of us uh and yeah uh we're actually you know joining together uh, for the next six months we're gonna cause some havoc havoc and come out and spread the message and tell the truth as a joint right. message we're instead of separately and yeah absolutely i mean it's it's once you're it's like part of that we, we kind of are like family because yeah. of that so because we were all abused in the same way through the same person in different ways and our worlds have gone upside down i mean if you take a look at my story is one thing, but some of these people, like you said, these general, like, you know, they, they've lived their whole life serving the country, going to the oath. And then this man tries to dis- embarrass them, you know, this, right. discredit their whole, all those years of service, put them, make, try and make him laughing stocks. I mean, it's, it's just disgusting, disgusting right. to watch what he, the, the damage that they, that he it caused to all of us. Yeah. And so, well, I, a little bit of breaking news and I look forward to it. I, I'm, I don't want to, uh, I, I don't tell me any more. I just want to see it play out. I'm very excited about the idea and more power. Well, we're to gonna you. Co- I promise you will come on health. Uh, Please. And yes. That'd be lovely. Yeah. Just yeah. have a, we'll have a group call and everybody could kind of chime in or whatever. I, and even if uh, you guys are going to be very busy, I have no doubt. Uh, but I, um, I, I, even if you have want to come on, say, I don't know, January 25th of next year and just come on to, <laughs> as a toast. Because I really do think Trump is going to lose this time. I don't think he has any Absolutely. shot. He's lost 30% of his party and they're never coming back. And I think a lot of folks like you even that might have been all in aren't anymore in a very yeah. important way. Yeah. 
So everybody wants to know, and these are, you know, uh, I, I don't know if this is like a lightning round for the end of this, so, <laughs> but uh, there are a couple of people you, you named in your testimony last week, specifically like Pete Sessions, was it? Um, and, yeah. and Ron Johnson, especially where yeah. you had interactions with these guys. And it's interesting how much Ron Johnson of all people has been able to <laughs> dodge kind of the stink of this when he's been up to his neck in it. And I, what's your experience with Ron Johnson and, and Pete Sessions? If you have, you know, either anecdotally interacting with them yeah. or, or your experience of who they are and what they're, what their kind of through line is? Are they cultists? Are they mercenaries? Do they uh, uh, both? Uh, you know, no, they're they're self centered. It's all about them. They don't they don't care about. They're, they're using that because they sold their soul to Trump. They they understand that. I mean, Sessions lost his race in two thousand and eighteen mm-hmm. and came back in twenty with Trump's help and support from his super PACs to get win another get back into it. Right. Funny part is uh, Sessions used to call me chairman. He used to be the chairman of the rank, uh, rules and and, and uh, committee, and he called me chairman. Everybody used to laugh at hmm. that. We we we, put, we had a really close relationship. We spent a lot of time together. Uh, Johnson, not so much. Uh, Johnson was uh, more kept on the outside, but he was the, to be able not to get linked to us. To be, but he his job was sure. to push uh, the the dirt and for the misinformation into the halls of Congress. Uh, and it's funny, Johnson. I mean, it's hilarious because he's one of the senators that vote that uh, wrote a letter to Ukraine. I mean, to to, to Congress to fire Viktor Shokin when he signed the letter right. to fire Viktor Shokin, and then he is now, you know, trying to say that he was, you know. So I, yeah, I don't know how that works. I don't know how he how he is able how it's legally. I don't know how it's legal for congressmen and senators to lie to the American people. That, that is the problem. Right. It's one thing Direct, to uh, I mean, lie about your opinion or your feelings or whether right, you think something right, is possible, right. but like right. material reality, right? Right. And that's the problem. The material, they go out there and yeah. they, should, they should be held accountable because if they wouldn't do it, Trump would not have this following. That's we, right. We would not have, because people don't understand, as powerful as Trump is, it's because of the enablers that he has that are out there doing his dirty work that he's able to be, just like just like any godfather needs his soldiers. Mm-hmm. These soldiers that he has are congressmen, senators, uh, uh, DO people right. in the DOJ, people in the FBI. Okay, go ahead. I'm sorry. Yeah, no lightning mm-hmm. route. No, no, yeah. No, I, I, I wanted to kind of go, like, with, you know, because f- I think at some point we're going to find out how the talking points get to Ron. And that will be a meaningful piece of information at some oh, I'll point. I'll tell you like, how they get there. I'll tell okay. you how they get to. Yeah. Oh, I'll, let's tell you again. Yeah, absolutely. Sure. So the way the, the way it would work uh, is, is a couple of ways. First of all, the BLT team made up of Tunzing, the Genova, uh, Solomon, Rudy, and myself. We'd get the information. Then Victoria Tunzing would pass it on to Ron Johnson. And then mm-hmm. Ron Johnson would get it. So that was one way. The other way is Solomon had direct uh, communication well, I mean, with they, okay. Johnson. Real, real quick. Uh, materially, and I think this is kind of important. Did was that an email he would get from Victoria Tensing, or uh, or from you know, or from the White there, House, there, or there, or there, there how? Were emails? He yeah. would get emails, and also sometimes, depending on the information, we'd meet at the Trump International. There would be packages being uh, handed off, just paperwork that wouldn't be sent an email. But mostly, everybody used Proton email, which is a very secretive email mm-hmm. that's. Uh, that the U.S. government can't break into. It's in, in Switzerland, and mm-hmm. all of all everybody on the team was using that. And the other way he was uh, so Ron Solomon Johnson has a Proton email. Um, uh, email I know account? I don't have it. I don't have it. I don't know. I so, but I would almost bet my life okay. on it because sure. every, everybody has. Uh, it's I fascinating. It, but, yeah. I I will I will take care of that, my friend. I will go hunt that down. Yeah. Um, Please do. Please yeah. Do hell, yeah. With my weirdo <laughs> dark web friends. Um, <laughs> not named after a computer for no reason at all no, so yeah definitely take a look at solemn and all of their protests if you could get i mean there's there's there, there's actually uh just mm-hmm. like what trump said if the russians could find hillary clinton if you could find there's a, a several hundreds of emails that uh, were wiped out by them right before i got arrested right uh, uh, that'd be you, helpful you be, oh okay. yeah <laughs> okay good to know um i i'll i'll uh, i'll talk to my uh my red team friends um <laughs> The uh, so there, you know, and uh, Pete Sessions and Bill Barr, I think, are the other two people as far as interactions that I'm curious about your interactions with them right. um, as far as the team. And and again, 
already we've established that Ron Johnson would get emails and packages of information delivered to him personally at the Trump Hotel. Was this a, a dining room or was there a hotel room that you guys rented that was the regular drop point? Or, I mean, oh, I'm no. fascinated oh, by no. the... No, by no, the... nothing happened. I, it was right in the wide open. I mean, people would meet in the lobby. People would meet in the restaurant. And the lobby was our office, basically. And when, they, right. when we had, like, very private meetings or uh, calls, then we would go upstairs in the BLT. There was a private room that... What's uh, the BLT? We would do. BLT is a steakhouse in Trump International Hotel. Right. So the reason we called ourselves the BLT team is because we would we'd have that private room that in the BLT restaurant that would be sw- swept once a week for uh, devices. Sure. Well, the, and uh, uh, something obviously the T is for Trump. What's the what's the B and the L? Baloney and it's a, lame. No. <laughs> I don't like it. He's so leave it to Trump to have a steakhouse named BLT. What a dipshit. Anyways, sorry. That's just my personal opinion. <laughs> BLT. What did you pour ketchup on? They had you a free bottle of ketchup. This is for your steak. Oh God, this is depressing. <laughs> um, so uh, okay, so that at the BLT club, uh, which is hilarious, and you'd meet with him, and then I guess with uh, Pete Sessions, it was a similar setup too, or no, Kevin Sessions, Nunes. No. No, Pete Sessions, uh, I had a very close personal relationship. I'd meet him in his office on the hill. Uh, I, we'd meet uh, at the hotel. We'd go out to restaurants. So Pete Sessions, I've had an extensive relationship. Ron Johnson, I had no relationship. He was more of just the person that was giving the information. Gotcha. Devin Nunez, Devin Nunez uh, mm-hmm. who tried to stay clear of the Trump, to, not to because he was, after they had the midnight run from the White House, he was, uh, the media was, mm-hmm looking at him so he sent uh he had two guys that were his uh staffers one was cash patel the other one was Derek harvey so mm-hmm. Derek harvey was tasked to work with us and the blt team to get the information and uh basically so they were the distribution yeah. network they were the so yeah. they would get the baggies the little white baggies of information and then they would stand by cars as they pulled up and you know yeah. uh <laughs> for lack of a better analogy so and uh, this is the other thing about the uh, about Bill Barr, and I and I'll let you go in just one moment. I'll remind everybody before I even ask you on this one. This is uh, um, hopefully we can have you on again sometime. Uh, Absolutely, especially yeah, with the other I guys. apologize. I was late. Absolutely, Not, I no, don't worry about late. it at all. Awesome. Love to have you, and thank you so much for doing this. Uh, there's you know plenty we could talk about because I'm a deep reads kind of a guy, as you can see. Um, and uh, this is his book, though Shadow Diplomacy. I bought it with my own uh, funds. And, uh, and eventually I will get a, a hard copy and eventually you can sign Absolutely. it for me. Right. I would love that. 100%. So, um, but in the, in the meantime, there are people who I think we all suspected were part of this. And then there are people who are were peripheral and you're like, like Rex Tillerson, for example, who was clearly something shitty was going on with him in this exchange and he, him dropping out right about the time that, you know, information was coming about his connection stuff is it's one of the people he's managed to dodge a lot of this stuff. And Bill Several Barr, people. yeah, there's a bunch of people like that, right? Bill Barr, though, was a is is still a curious animal for a lot of people about like how much he was helping Trump versus helping America and all that stuff, versus is how read in he was on what was going on and what's you know what he th- what yeah, so, purpose he thought he was serving. Yeah, so Bill Barr is the is the worst of them all, and Bill mm-hmm. Barr could be in front of Congress and being questioned because if it wasn't for Bill Barr, this, we would not be here. Donald Trump would not be here. Right. Everything Bill Barr did was for Bill Barr and not for uh, Donald Trump or for America. Mm-hmm. He thought he was smarter than Donald Trump. He thought he could control Donald Trump. From the first day Bill Barr came into office, he was given the investigation that we were being investigated because Rudy Giuliani was Trump's lawyer. He followed and was being given reports on a daily or weekly, whatever, about what was going on with us in Ukraine. So he knew everything. The right. reason of our arrest, as timely as or untimely as it, it was, was because Bill Barr understood that if I got on that plane with Rudy Giuliani, we would be coming back with a hard drive or some paperwork and in an interview about information that was being spent sent by the Russians. Because Bill Barr understood that this was Russian propaganda. Yeah. But he understood, but he also understood that Trump and Giuliani didn't care and they were still going to use it and push it through the halls of Congress. So he thought to put an end to all of this, I was the perfect scapegoat. Mm-hmm. Arrest me because he also was scared that I would get subpoenaed to go testify in front of Congress. 
Right. And he knew that I would be, I would think that I'm coming out there at that time with the evidence and mm -hmm. we would be embarrassed and look like we, you know, it would be a sham. So Bill Barr understood that the evidence was false and he was trying to shut it down, but not by shutting it out, by going after Trump and Giuliani and saying you're doing something wrong, by covering up for them, by making me as the fall guy, taking yeah. all my information, shutting it up, hiding it, and then making me look like a crazy man, discrediting me, saying I'm a liar, I'm, I'm a criminal. Now nobody wants to hear my uh, testimony. Like right. Jamie Raskin said at this impeachment, that if I would have testified in the first impeachment, we wouldn't be here today Yep, because of all the information we had. Not only that, but they went a step further. Bill Barr even went a step further to cover up their steps. He went then ahead and uh, uh, nominated a special counsel, Scott Brady, to take over everything that had to do with Ukraine, to filter, and this is important, to filter to make sure that Russian disinformation doesn't sli slip through and get into the DOJ or the halls of Congress. Instead, what they did is they opened the open pipeline for Russian disinformation and shut up my information that discredited right. all of that. They had all of that from 2019, but they allowed to this Smirnov Russian to spread the Russian disinformation. So that needs to be met. That's why I say, yes, there are criminals and criminals need to. But then there's also enablers or people that cover it up. that are a lot worse. Right. And Bill Barr had the opportunity to stop it. So he basically covered it up and kept it going and only. When he got too hot for himself, when he realized Trump completely won off the rockers with January 6th, yeah. and he wanted to hire another uh, attorney general to write that false letter, only then did Bill Barr try to go on this redemption turn and say, oh, Trump's a bad guy. Right. But why didn't, why didn't he stop him? He had the keys to stop him. Yeah. The... Oops, hold on one second. My... So... Um... Yeah. One of the... Okay. Um, and I'm going to let you go because I kept you over at another... Uh, couple minutes, but the, um, and I appreciate you coming on. I really do. People should check out the book. Uh, I've enjoyed it so far and I would love to dive into more of it. Um, you know, uh, at a later date too, because this is a, this is a book about the historical impact of this circumstance, as opposed to a book about, you know, like a narrative tailor. I mean, it tells your story as a human being from where you came from and, and how you ended up in that first place. But also there's a lot of historically significant stuff, major turning Absolutely. points in Amer American, um, you know, political machinations happened while you were standing right there. My, yep. um, uh, you know, Bill Barr, for those that don't know, one of the reasons why Trump brought him in is possibly his Roy Cohn and why he thought he would be is because Bill Barr is the guy who got um, uh, Bush one's uh, diaries excluded from evidence in the follow-up to Iran-Contra, which he wrote down basically everybody who was involved and his involvement and his awareness of that involvement in his journals. And they got to, that that became separate from notes you make on real government paper versus notes you make in your own book. And Bill Barr believes in the supreme executive power of the president, that the president is the one person elected by the whole populace and therefore exactly right. he's exactly bigger than everybody right. else. He's big, he's got, he should have more power. And so he's really there for that mission. Whether yep. it, And he thought, I think, that Trump is so ham-handed and stupid, he's going to fuck up the whole thing. Oh, absolutely. And, At first he thought he could control him. That he, so, yeah. he thought he was so stupid that he could control him. And then when he realized that he's going to fuck up the whole thing is when he jumped shit. Yep. Absolutely. 100%. You said it, Hal, on the dot. It was all about his mission. It was about the presidency. And mm -hmm. that was... 100 percent that's what he thinks 100%. his history is and he'll be at yeah. it as best he can in other if there's another republican presidency he'll be lurking around in the back trying to write briefs and other shit to secure the strength of the presidency over congress over the house and senate over the scotus even because that's that's not, what they not, believe not that's we, yeah not not if not if we win the house and we and next year we hold hearings and get to the bottom of it and get the truth out uh he won't be writing anything these people nope. will be behind bars that, and looking to you know how to save themselves <laughs> instead of and that's what needs to happen because that's the yes. only way we could stop from there and going forward because otherwise you're 100 right hal these same characters will be in another political race just look what manafort look at Ma the perfect oh example look at what's going on with manafort you know what i'm saying to you you gotta be kidding me so look i mean they the, the crazy part is they're not hiding it guys they're not mm -hmm. hiding it. They're, they're doing it. Before they hit it, they did. It. Now they're doing it in open sight. They don't care. They're flaunting in your face. Right. And open up your eyes. Wake up. Smell the coffee. 
I appreciate that on no better uh, note to end on. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, love to your family, your son and your uh, daughter and your dogs and everybody who was uh, playing around in the background. Uh, I appreciate you jumping in and uh, I'd love to have you back uh, very soon and uh, pick your brain even more. Um, and, and I just thank you a lot for being here. Thank you for having me, Hal. Absolutely. I, we have some good stuff coming up, and I will definitely love to come on and discuss it on your show. That's great. And, you, and you do have some good stuff already. There's the book right now. Um, again, it's available on Amazon and elsewhere. Um, I have it on my Kindle, as it were. And thank you so much. Appreciate it. Thank you. All right. All right. There he goes. Ladies and gentlemen, be well. Off he goes. Thanks so much, Lev. Uh, appreciate it. Uh, that was fantastic. Um, really good stuff and a, and a great, um, here, I'll let you go to, I'll get you out of here. Uh, Lev, you're good. Uh, you are free. There you are. <laughs> um, thanks so much everybody for sticking around for the extra hour. Cause I, I have, I didn't even scratch the surface of some of the stuff. I just didn't want to keep them on forever. Cause you know me, I'd go through the whole goddamn book page by page, but I do recommend it. It's a, it, it's a good read so far. Um, and there's so many details to this that uh, I'm going to I'm gonna jump into this later on today. In the afternoon show, I want to show you some of the stuff I stumbled upon about Trump Soho, just to give you a general idea of the kind of, like, freaky, mobbed-up bullshit Trump has been engaged in forever. Stuff that would have excluded him if, if anybody had just dived into... There are days gone past when Trump Soho, the tower itself would have been enough to exclude him from being a presidential candidate never mind the other shit so we'll talk about this this afternoon i want to show it to you later but i you know i've, I've gone long anyways and i appreciate it uh i will see you guys later on this afternoon take care of yourself and take care of somebody else and thanks again to lev and philip itner for being on there congrats philip for your new studio it looks awesome and yes i'm jealous joyce thank you for the super chat that's uh that is uh, wonderful. Thank you so much. Hold on. I want to, and awesome. There we go. I got to scroll this down. I was, I was like, where did it go? Um, yes. Mad Max says, thank you, Lev. Um, there you go. Great show today. Oh, that's, thanks guys. Um, excellent. Thank you. You know, I'm, I'm getting the hang of this, uh, interview thing. Um, one day if I try really hard, I'll, I'll be as uh, boring as that other dude who always wears a suit and, and whispers all of his questions. What's that guy's name? You guys know who I'm talking about? The super weird guy that's interviewing everyone who just seems really peculiar. Do you know what I'm talking about? You know that guy? What's it? Whatever his name is. is it, you know, exa just me doing this. Some of you know exactly who I'm talking to. Anyways, uh, <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, love you guys. Uh, see you later. Uh, take care. And, uh, this, and uh, what does this button do? Yes, and thank you to Andrea for setting up the interview and organizing it. Really, really appreciate it. So great. <laughs>